This happened to me on June 19, 2002, outside of a small town in Idaho called Elk River. Most folks around here haven't even heard of it. It's just a speck on the map in the middle of nowhere. My name's Officer Tom Crandall, and I've been with the Clearwater County Sheriff's Department for 10 years. We don't get much action around here, which is fine by me. Usually, the worst thing I see is petty theft or the occasional bar fight. So you can imagine my surprise when things took a dark turn that Wednesday night. I'm from a hunting family. I spent my childhood out in those woods, tracking deer and fishing the river. That's why it bothers me so much, what happened that night. See, I know those woods like the back of my hand. Or at least I thought I did. It started with a routine call about a domestic disturbance out on Bear Creek Road. It was about 11 p.m., and I figured on an argument fueled by beer or an old grudge that flared up. I headed out alone, which in hindsight may not have been the smartest move. Bear Creek Road's a lonely stretch, winding its way through the National Forest. The trees grow so thick they block out the moonlight. You need those high beams to see anything out there. After about 15 minutes, I spotted the house, a rundown double-wide trailer set back from the road, bathed in the harsh glow of a porch light. I parked the cruiser and grabbed my flashlight as I approached. There was a beat-up pickup truck in the yard. The domestic calls usually go one of two ways. Either it's dead quiet, everybody's already ashamed and pretending nothing happened, or there's total chaos when you arrive. This time it was the former. I knocked on the flimsy aluminum door, and it swung open before I could even try the handle. A young woman stood there, eyes red and swollen from crying. She couldn't have been more than twenty. Next to her was a little boy, maybe three or four years old. He was clutching her leg and whimpering softly. I introduced myself, and the woman, whose name was Sarah, invited me in. The trailer was a mess clothes strewn all over, an overturned bowl on the kitchen floor. I didn't see any signs of a struggle, no broken furniture, no blood. Sitting at the kitchen table was a man, her husband, I presumed. Let's just call him Rick. He was a big guy, built like a linebacker, and he reeked of booze. I began by asking Sarah what happened, tried to get her statement, but that's when Rick decided to chime in. It was nothing. Just a stupid lover's quarrel, officer. He slurred. No need to waste your time here. Okay, sir, I said, trying to stay calm. I'll need to talk to your wife separately for a moment. Maybe you could step outside? Rick scowled but finally relented and went out to the porch. I turned back to Sarah. I could tell she was scared of him. Ma'am, I'm going to need your honest account of what happened tonight. Did your husband hit you or threaten you in any way? She hesitated, glancing towards the porch where Rick was taking loud swigs from a beer bottle. Finally, in a hushed voice, she said, He slapped me. A few times. But please, it's okay. He just, well, he gets angry sometimes, especially when he's been drinking. I'd heard that excuse more times than I could count. Ma'am, it's not okay. Do you want to file charges? Before Sarah could answer, I heard a crash outside, followed by a loud, guttural roar that sent chills down my spine. My ears perked up. It didn't sound human. What the hell was that? Rick barged back inside, his face flushed. Sarah and the little boy were huddled in the corner, looking terrified. I don't know. It sounded like, Sarah whispered. Like what? A bear? Rick cut in with a mocking tone. I went out on the porch, switching on my flashlight. There was nothing to see, just the impenetrable darkness of the forest. 
My instincts were screaming at me. Something was out there. Officer, I heard it too, Sarah said, peering out the doorway nervously. Rick just rolled his eyes. Look, officer, this was all a big misunderstanding. He put on a fake smile and held out his hand. I apologize. How about we just forget this whole thing happened, okay? I reluctantly shook his hand, but my mind was racing. That sound was like nothing I'd ever heard before. I looked back at Sarah and the little boy. They were too scared to argue. I could arrest Rick on domestic charges, but I knew Sarah wouldn't testify against him, and he'd be back on the streets in no time, angrier than ever. Instead, I decided to give them all a stern warning and keep them under observation for the night. Rick, I'm going to park down the road for a while, just to keep an eye on things. You lay one hand on your wife or that boy, and I'm coming back here and hauling you off to jail. Got it? He nodded sullenly. I went back to my cruiser and positioned it about fifty yards down the road, keeping the house in my sights. I radioed back to the station, filled out some paperwork, and tried to settle in. It was a humid night, and the mosquitoes were out in force. But I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Staring into that inky blackness, I couldn't help but think about the roar, the look on Sarah's face. Whatever made that noise, it wasn't a bear, that much I knew for sure. The night stretched on, and I fought to stay awake. I started thinking about all the rumors about those woods people seeing strange lights, hearing unexplainable sounds. Most folks dismiss them as tall tales or the effects of too much moonshine. But sitting there alone, it started to make my skin crawl. Around 3 a.m., something startled me awake. I blinked, trying to regain focus. And then I saw it, a pair of glowing eyes staring at me from the darkness. They were low to the ground, about thirty feet into the tree lean. They didn't look like any animal eyes I knew. My flashlight was in the glove box, and I fumbled to find it. When I finally got it out and flicked it on, the eyes vanished. I sat bolt upright, my heart pounding. My mind went into overdrive. What the hell was that? I was about to radio back to the station when I saw movement near the edge of the woods. A massive figure emerged from the shadows, slowly walking towards Rick's truck. It was at least eight feet tall, hunched over, with long, powerful limbs. Even in the dim light, I could make out matted dark fur and a long, tapered snout. I stared dumbfounded. It was like something from a nightmare. Before I could fully comprehend what I was seeing, the creature ripped open the truck's door like it was made of paper. Rick staggered out onto the porch, yelling incoherently. He must have passed out inside the vehicle. For a split second, we locked eyes, me and the creature. I remember its eyes glowing with an eerie yellow light. A chill ran through my body like I'd never felt before. It turned its attention back to Rick. In one swift motion, it lunged forward, and a blood-curdling scream pierced the night. Sarah and the child let out horrified gasps. The creature grabbed Rick and dragged him, kicking and screaming, back into the woods. Within seconds, the night was silent again, except for whimpering from the trailer. I sat in my cruiser, paralyzed with fear. My logical mind grappled with what I had just witnessed. It was impossible, and yet my eyes didn't lie. The rational part of me screamed that I should call for backup, wait for reinforcements before taking any action. But every instinct in my body told me time was of the essence. Sarah and that little boy were in immediate danger. I couldn't stand by and let that thing hurt them any further. I snatched my shotgun from the rack and a box of shells. Loading the weapon with trembling hands, I quietly exited the cruiser. 
My flashlight beam cut a shaky path through the darkness towards the trailer. Each step felt like a mile. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, a strange mix of terror and determination. I could hear Sarah sobbing inside the trailer, the terrified cries of the little boy echoing in the night. As I neared the porch, a foul stench hit me the metallic tang of blood, mixed with a musky, animal odor. My stomach churned. The front door swung open and Sarah stood there, her face streaked with tears. The little boy clung to her leg, his eyes wide with terror. Please, you have to help him. That thing, it took him. Sarah choked out the words, her voice ragged. Behind them, the trailer was in disarray, furniture overturned, the floor slick with something dark. Get in the cruiser, both of you. I ordered, my voice steadier than I felt. We need to get out of here, now. Sarah didn't hesitate. She picked up the boy, and they hurried towards my car. I covered them, scanning the woods, the shotgun poised and ready. They scrambled inside, Sarah murmuring reassurances to the child, though she was shaking uncontrollably. I circled around to the driver's side. Just as I was about to shut the door, the creature burst from the darkness. I unleashed a volley of blasts from the shotgun, but the creature was too fast, weaving and dodging like a shadow. I managed to graze it. I heard an enraged snarl cut through the night. It retreated back into the woods, but I knew it wouldn't be gone for long. Slamming the cruiser's door shut, I sped down Bear Creek Road, the headlights boring a weak tunnel into the black. Sarah huddled with the whimpering child in the back seat. I radioed for backup, my voice choked and urgent. It felt like forever before reinforcements arrived, two county cars and a unit from the state troopers. We secured a perimeter around the trailer in the growing dawn light. The woods were eerily quiet. Cautiously, I led the team of officers into the trailer. The smell of blood was overpowering. We found Rick's remains, a gruesome scene that I won't describe. I'll always regret not getting there sooner. The thing tore him apart like an animal. An extensive search of the woods and the surrounding area yielded nothing. It was like the creature had vanished into thin air. The state wildlife team came in and surveyed the remains and the damage to Rick's truck. They were baffled, unable to identify any known animal species. News of the brutal attack spread like wildfire through the tight-knit community of Elk River. Panic gripped the town. Folks were terrified to leave their homes after dark. Rumors started swirling, tall tales about monsters and cryptids fueled by fear and by the strange things that had always lurked in the shadows of those woods. I never saw the creature again. I spent months patrolling the area around Bear Creek Road, staking out the woods at night, but there wasn't a trace of it. The official report deemed it a bear attack, an abnormally vicious one. But Sarah and I, we knew the truth. We saw its burning eyes— witnessed the raw power it possessed. In the years that followed, life in Elk River went back to a semblance of normalcy. The fear gradually faded, but people became more cautious, more respectful of the wilderness that surrounded the town. I continued serving with the sheriff's department, that night forever seared into my memory. I tried to warn others— tried to make them understand that there are things in this world that science can't explain, darkness that logic can't illuminate. Some folks believed me, but most called me crazy, traumatized. Maybe they were right. Sarah and her son moved away, back to her family in a bigger town. I don't blame her. They deserved a fresh start, a chance to put the horrors of that night behind them. I kept my shotgun loaded and close by my bed, even though I knew, deep down, that if the creature ever returned, a shotgun wouldn't be enough to stop it. 
The events of that summer changed me. It shattered my naive sense of safety and order. I'll never again brush off those tales of things that go bump in the night, those whispers about creatures lurking in the forgotten corners of our world. Sometimes the most impossible things are the most real. Sometimes the truth hides in the shadows, out there in the vastness of the wilderness, where the darkness is deepest. This happened to me on October 6, 2009. Marriage had gone sour. The big city felt like it was suffocating me, so I up and bought a trailer on the cheap, tucked it away on a patch of land up in the Ozarks. Figured a change of scenery might fix what ailed my soul. Name's Everett. Everett Barnes. That first summer was paradise. Taught myself to fix up my little home, plant a garden, hunt squirrels in the dense forest. The quiet, the vastness of it all, it made my problems feel smaller somehow. Then the cold came. Those hills can be brutal come winter, the kind of cold that seeps into your bones. Found myself in the general store in town more often, just for the human contact. Folks there were friendly, but wary of outsiders. Eyes would follow me as I walked the aisles, muttered conversations went silent when I passed. That's where I first heard the whispers about him, Seek the Hermit. Said he lived deep in the woods, hadn't been seen in town for years. Some claimed he was a Vietnam vet, gone feral from the horrors he'd witnessed. Others swore he was something older, some kind of guardian spirit tied to the land itself. Didn't pay much mind to it at the time. One February afternoon, out checking my traps, that's when I found the first carcass. Half buried in the snow, it was a deer, but stripped in a way that sent shivers down my spine. The flesh looked torn, ragged, and there was an odd smell in the air, like rot mixed with something musky and foul. More carcasses followed, scattered throughout the woods, Always dear, always ravaged in the same unnatural way. Tension crept into the town, a quiet unease that hung in the air. Zeke became the talk of the place. Some swore they'd seen lights flickering in the woods, heard inhuman howls in the dead of night. Fear started twisting its way into my own thoughts, too. Then came the morning I woke up to find my dog, Patches, missing. She was a scrappy mutt not afraid of anything. The trail behind my trailer told a grim story, a struggle, splashes of blood on the snow, and tracks dragging into the woods, my dogs, and something else's. The tracks, they were the size of a bear's, but something was wrong. They shifted, sometimes going deep on four legs, sometimes rising up on two. The pads were longer, claw marks sharper, Panic and rage surged through me. I grabbed my rifle and followed the trail. It led me deeper into the woods, the silence broken only by the crunch of snow beneath my boots. The air grew heavier, the foul stench intensifying. And then I saw it, just a glimpse at first through the trees, a massive, hunched form retreating into the undergrowth. Patches was gone, only her collar left tangled in the branches. I knelt there in the snow, heart pounding, trying to make sense of what I'd seen. It had moved with unnatural speed, its fur patchy and coarse. The head, what I could glimpse of it, was too long, too narrow for any bear. Words spread through the town like wildfire. A hunting party was organized, the men armed to the teeth. They asked me to come but some primal fear took hold of me. I watched them head out, the fading sunlight glinting off their rifles, and I knew deep down it was a fool's errand. That night, the creature came for me. I'd barricaded myself inside the trailer, boarded up the windows, my loaded rifle propped by the door. 
It started as a scratching sound outside, like claws scrabbling at the thin metal walls. Then came the growls, low and guttural, circling my makeshift fortress. The trailer shook as the creature threw its weight against it, again and again, the deafening impacts jarring every bone in my body. Hours of that torture went by. My mind raced, a panic mix of fury and stark terror. I pictured the creature outside, its hulking form, its foul breath, its eyes burning with predatory hunger. Just when I thought the trailer would give way, the assault stopped. Silence fell, but I didn't dare look out, didn't dare fall asleep. I huddled on the floor, rifle clutched in my trembling hands, and waited. Dawn brought a horrifying sight. The ground outside was marked with its massive tracks blood spattered the steps, but of patches or the creature, I couldn't say. I knew then it was over. My sanctuary was tainted, the woods poisoned. With a heavy heart, I abandoned my trailer and fled the Ozarks. Never looked back. City life ain't so bad now, with its noise and crowds. Better to be surrounded by the indifference of strangers than the hungry attention of something unseen. I sleep with the lights on, a habit I can't break. Sometimes I swear I hear the scratching at my window, or the low rumble of a growl carried on the wind. And I remember the Ozarks, the lurking shadows, and the knowledge that certain places hold an old, untamed darkness. That somewhere out there, maybe it waits. Maybe it remembers. Maybe the old-timers were right, and it's best to leave some legends undisturbed. They call them the Ozark Collars, those unseen things the locals say haunt the deepest woods. After what I saw, well, I'm inclined to believe. My name is Thomas Redfern, and this happened to me in the summer of 1997. I was working on a remote stretch of the Appalachian Trail, a routine survey assignment for the Parks Department. It was just me in the wilderness, or so I thought. My official title is a bit of a mouthful, Cryptozoological Containment Specialist. It sounds ridiculous, even to me, but it pays the bills. The government isn't big on admitting things like Bigfoot or werewolves exist, but things go bump in the night, and someone's got to deal with them. I'm the guy they call when those bumps start leaving bodies. We were tracking something in those mountains. Whatever it was was big, messy, and hungry. Hikers had been going missing for months season outdoorsmen, folks who know the trails like the back of their hands. Nothing was ever recovered, not even scraps of clothing. We thought it might be a bear that had gotten a taste for human flesh, but bears don't clean skeletons to the bone. The morning I made contact, I was heading deeper into the woods to check a series of motion-activated cameras. Midday sun filtered through the canopy, and the buzzing of insects was almost deafening. I was sweating through my shirt by that point, cursing the thick summer air. Then the buzzing stopped. One second it was a wall of sound, the next, dead silence. Birdsong died. The forest went still. That silence is what hunters and prey live by, the quiet before the kill. Every instinct I had screamed at me to get the hell out of there. But I had a job to do. I kept moving, my senses on high alert. The smell hit me first rotting meat sharp and heavy in the thick air. It was close. My pulse thundered in my ears, every crackle of leaves under my boots sounding like rifle fire. I rounded a bend in the trail, and there it was. My first thought was that it must have been a deer, or maybe an elk. What was left of it was strewn across the path, ribcage picked clean, for matted with blood. No predator I knew of could have done that. And then I saw the footprints. 
They weren't animal tracks. More like a man's, only far too big. The stride was long, and deep indentations in the earth suggested massive weight. My blood ran cold. Whatever made those tracks was nearby and still hungry. Then I heard a crack from deeper in the trees. I froze, rifle raised, but it wasn't the crack of a twig underfoot. It was bones snapping. That's when I saw him. He moved with impossible speed, a blur of muscle and matted fur. He was built like a man, easily seven feet tall and impossibly broad. His face, it twisted, canine and cruel, eyes glowing a fierce yellow in the dim light. A low growl echoed through the trees, almost human in its rage. He knew I was there. Instinct took over. I fired twice, the rifle barking against the silence, but the creature was already moving. It charged. I had a glimpse of claws flashing, the stench of hot breath, and then impact. I was flying backward, rifle knocked from my hands. Pain exploded in my side where his claws had raked. I hit the ground hard, gasping. He towered over me, a hulking shadow against the light. I fumbled for my sidearm, but it was futile. In that moment I knew two things with absolute certainty. This was no animal, and I was about to die. I scrambled back, trying to put space between us. My eyes searched desperately for an escape route, but there was none. He took a step closer, growling, and that's when I noticed something odd. His focus wasn't solely on me. It flickered over my shoulder, back towards the cameras I had been sent to check. Whatever it was, it had him spooked. I seized the moment. I lunged to the side and bolted. Gunshots rang out from further down the trail my team had arrived. The distraction bought me just enough time. The creature roared in fury, its attention torn. I scrambled into the thicket, adrenaline masking the searing pain in my side. I didn't look back. Heart pounding, I stumbled through the undergrowth, ignoring the branches tearing at my clothes and skin. The shouts of my team grew fainter replaced by the guttural snarls of the creature giving chase. Or perhaps it was following them. The thought spurred me on. I knew those woods better than most, but sheer panic propelled me forward. I ran blindly, branches whipping my face, until I tripped and tumbled down a steep embankment. Pain ripped through my ankle as I landed awkwardly, but I forced myself up, limping towards a familiar landmark a creek snaking through the forest. Splashing into the icy water, I ignored the shock, fighting the current to wade upstream. The cold numbed my throbbing injuries, my mind focused on a single thought, create distance. After what felt like hours, I hauled myself onto the bank and collapsed, exhaustion washing over me. The creature couldn't have followed my scent through the water, could it? My respite was short-lived. Shots echoed downstream, followed by a terrifying roar that cut through the trees. My team was in trouble. Guilt and a desperate sense of responsibility gnawed at me. I had to do something. Drawing on every bit of remaining strength, I pushed myself back to my feet. My twisted ankle throbbed, but the woodsman in me took over. I knew of a ranger cabin a few miles north uphill. If I could reach it, there might be a radio, a chance for backup. The hike was an agonizing blur. My lungs burned, my vision swam, but sheer terror kept me going. Every rustle of leaves had me flinching, expecting the creature to burst from the undergrowth. But it never did. Finally, the cabin came into sight— a ramshackle blessing in the wilderness. Stumbling inside, I slammed the door and bolted it, my heart a frantic drum in my ears. The place reeked of dust and disuse, but the sight of a radio on the rickety table made hope surge through me. 
I fumbled with numb fingers, praying for a signal. Static crackled. Then a voice broke through. Redfern, report. What the hell is going on out there? It was Morgan, our mission coordinator. Swallowing hard, I keyed the mic, voice trembling. Morgan, it got them. It, it's not an animal. We need extraction ASAP. A stunned silence filled the airwaves. Then, Morgan's voice came back, tight and professional. Negative Redfern. Cleanup is en route. You are to remain on site and maintain radio contact. Clean up? My skin prickled with dread. I knew what that meant. The government's solution to things that couldn't be explained was to sweep them under the rug. My team, any evidence of the creature. It would all disappear. They wouldn't even find bodies. That thing didn't leave scraps behind. I wanted to scream, to argue, but it was futile. Protocol was protocol. The best I could do was warn them. I described the creature in chilling detail, omitting any speculation on what it truly was. The response was chilling. Noted. Cleanup will be advised. Remain in place. Help is on the way. The lie in those words stung. I wasn't an idiot. No help was coming from either. As the sun began to set, I knew my time was running out. I used the cabin's meager supplies to barricade the doors and windows, but it felt pathetically futile. The creature would tear right through it when it returned, and it would return. The waiting was the worst part. Every creak of the old cabin made me jump. With the fading light, shadows seemed to writhe, playing tricks on my exhausted mind. Had I imagined the whole thing? My gashed side and throbbing ankle were grim reminders that the nightmare was all too real. As darkness fell, the forest outside grew eerily quiet. Not even the crickets chirped. Then it came the rhythmic thud of approaching footsteps, shaking the cabin walls. It began to circle the cabin, its growls echoing through the night. It slammed against the door making the flimsy wood groan. Each crash was a countdown, a reminder of my impending doom. I retreated to the furthest corner, huddling on the floor with the shotgun I'd found stashed under the cot. It brought little comfort. I knew it would barely slow that creature down. Resignation settled over me. I wouldn't be another missing person in the woods, another unsolved mystery. I'd make damn sure there was something left to find. Hours must have ticked by. The creature's assaults grew less frequent, replaced by an unnerving silence. My own breathing sounded deafening in the quiet. It was playing with me, just like a cat with a mouse. A cold realization struck. The silence wasn't a reprieve. It was a strategy. The creature was waiting for me to break to make a desperate move. I was trapped. Surrounded. Outmatched. Then a different thought pierced the despair. They knew where I was. My radio signal was a beacon for the cleanup crew. While the creature toyed with me, they were closing in. That wasn't hope exactly, but it ignited a spark of defiance. I wasn't going down without a fight. I crept to the window, peeking through a gap in the boards. In the pale moonlight, I saw a line of dark figures converging on the cabin. Not a rescue team black-suited operatives, armed to the teeth. Clean up. They were here to sanitize the situation, to eliminate witnesses along with the evidence. That meant me. A bitter rage coursed through me. I'd played by their rules, done my damn job. And this was my reward. A bullet in the back from my own side. The creature chose that moment to strike again. The door splintered inwards, showering me with debris. Its grotesque form filled the doorway, teeth bared in a snarl. In that instant, 
a twisted plan formed in my desperate mind. The operatives outside heard the commotion. Gunfire erupted, bullets peppering the cabin walls. The creature roared in pain and whipped around, momentarily distracted. Seizing the opportunity, I burst from cover. I sprinted for the tree line, ignoring the shouts of the startled operatives. Bullets was past my ears, some close enough to sting. I wasn't sure if they were shooting at me or the creature that burst from the ruined doorway, chaos erupting behind me. The forest swallowed me up. I ran until my lungs threatened to burst, until the shouts and gunfire faded into the distance. I was a fugitive now, a liability the government would gladly erase. I didn't stop, didn't dare look back. Eventually, exhaustion forced me to take cover, to hole up in a mossy hollow beneath a fallen tree. My body throbbed, my injuries screaming in protest. But rest was a luxury I couldn't afford. In the morning, I'd move again. Keep moving. Find a way off these mountains, a way to disappear. The creature was the least of my worries now. I lay there, staring up at the sliver of sky visible between the leaves, and finally let the tears come. I wept for my team, for the life I had lost, for the shattered belief that anyone would come for me if I fell. The aftermath of that day was as messy as it was inevitable. The official report would cite an animal attack, maybe a rogue bear with a taste for the dramatic. The creature, if its remains were ever found, would be dissected in some sterile government lab, its true nature buried under layers of red tape and official denials. As for me, Thomas Redfern, cryptozoological containment specialist, effectively ceased to exist. I became a ghost, a whisper in the wind. I survived by living in the shadows, taking odd jobs under assumed names, always one step ahead of the hunters I knew would forever be on my trail. Some nights, lying awake in a rundown motel room or under the vast expanse of the open sky, I think back to that cabin, that terrible night. I see the creature's blazing eyes and taste the copper tang of fear. But what haunts me most is the memory of those black-suited figures, their cold indifference, the realization that the true monsters sometimes wear tailored suits and speak in hushed tones behind closed doors. My name is Marcus Wells, and this happened to me on October 6th, 2008. I'm married, with two little girls. Work as a mechanic, keep my head down, do my job. Back then, though, I'd signed on for a whole other kind of work, a different kind of paycheck. There's a part of the government that deals with, well, let's just say things that don't fit neatly into science textbooks. That was my crew. This particular October, we were sent into the heart of Appalachia. Folks in these remote hollers had been whispering for years about lights in the woods, strange howls at night, livestock disappearing. We figured it was most likely poachers, maybe some backwoods cult doing strange rituals. We were there to put the fear of God into whoever was stirring up trouble. Our crew consisted of me, the field guy, Jackson, our leader, all no nonsense ex military, Patel, the tech expert, and Davis, fresh faced and straight out of the academy. We set up base camp in a dense patch of forest near where most of the sightings had been reported, the smell of pine needles and wet leaves heavy in the air. Standard protocol at first take accounts from the locals, set cameras, the works. Days bled into nights, and we got nothing. No tracks that shouldn't be there, no weird readings on Patel's gadgets. Locals got jittery. Jackson got impatient. The kid, Davis, he started to crack jokes to ease the tension, but nobody laughed much. Then, it was Carter's turn to vanish. 
old-timer, lived alone in a cabin a mile or so deeper into the woods. We went to investigate, nerves on edge. Found the cabin smashed to splinters. Furniture was upturned, blood was splattered all over the walls. Human, the forensics guys on call would confirm later. But the kicker, there was a huge, clawed handprint pressed into the wood, fingers as thick as my forearm. Jackson called it in. Higher up said to search the area thoroughly. The sun was dipping below the tree line by the time we set out, casting long shadows through the forest. My stomach sank when we reached a narrow ravine. Ragged scraps of Carter's clothing hung in the branches, and the ground, the ground was spattered with blood and dark chunks of something I didn't want to identify. That was when the feeling hit me, like being watched from the darkness. Hairs stood up on the back of my neck. I signaled the others. They were on alert too, rifles raised, scanning the encroaching twilight. It could have been a bear— or a cougar, tried to tell myself that, but the rational part of my brain was shrinking by the second. Patel swore, his eyes glued to a handheld device. Guys, I'm picking up something on thermal, something big, moving fast through the trees. We went back to back, forming a circle. The air crackled with tension. Then, a branch snapped loud behind us. We spun, guns raised. It was just Davis, face pale. He stammered something about tripping. The laughter died in my throat when I saw what lay hidden on the ground behind him. A deer carcass. No, not the whole deer. Just the hindquarters, ripped clean off, like something had taken a monstrous bite out of the animal. The fresh blood glistened in the gathering darkness. Jackson swore. Let's get back to camp. Call for extraction. We started back, trying to stick close, not letting shadows get between us. Then came the sound. A low, guttural growl, rumbling up from the earth. It echoed through the ravine, bouncing off the trees. Something was out there, big and angry. Something that wanted us. We sprinted through the trees, boots pounding the forest floor. The smell of rot thickened, almost overpowering. Just as the trees thinned ahead, and I caught a glimpse of our camp lights, a shape exploded out of the undergrowth and slammed into Davis. He went flying backward, screaming. We opened fire, the gunshots shattering the night. Saw a massive, hunched figure, covered in coarse gray hair. Eyes burned like embers, flickering in the muzzle flashes. It let loose a roar that wasn't human, snatched Davis with one clawed hand, and vanished back into the black woods. Davis's screams were cut short. We found what was left of him a day later, strung up in the trees like a hunter's trophy. Never found the creature. Tried to pass it off as a freak animal attack, but no bear— no wolf tears a man to pieces like that. Those, those eyes still haunt me sometimes. I put in for leave after that. Moved the family, started a new life fixing cars instead of hunting monsters. I tell myself that I'm out. But looking back, I know the truth. Whatever lurks out there in those woods, it's still out there. And sometimes... When the shadows stretch long in the quiet, I swear I feel those eyes on me again. My name is David Reed, and this happened to me in September 2011. I never talk about this, and I don't tell stories. But I have the feeling you won't believe me. I work for a secret government monster hunting agency, and you won't find any info on it online. It's better this way. If this got out, you know. People in suits knocking at your door at midnight wouldn't be a surprise. Our team has a name, 
Phantom. I'm the recon guy. I scout, analyze, and report back. We were called to a national forest in Northern California. It was a simple missing persons case initially. Hikers, campers gone without a trace. No bodies, no evidence. Locals blamed bears and mountain lions, and it made sense, but there were too many disappearances over a short period. And then came the messed up stuff. There were photos. Blurry, but you couldn't miss it. A huge, dark figure, hunched over a, well, let's just say it didn't resemble a pile of leaves anymore. It was humanoid, but taller than any basketball player and built thick. Those photos were what got us involved. We arrived late one night. There were four of us. Jensen, the muscle of the team, a real hothead. Simmons, the tech expert, the brains. Miller, our medic and a good man, probably the only reason I survived. And me, David Reed, the eyes and ears. We set up camp near a trailhead. It was an unseasonably warm night. Even for late summer, it was odd. We kept watching shifts two on, two off. Miller and I took first watch. The hours were uneventful. Sounds of the forest, the usual. We handed off to Simmons and Jensen around two in the morning. I woke to a scream. A man screamed full of terror. Jensen's voice. I grabbed my rifle, Miller beside me. We were out of the tent in a flash, but Simmons was gone. His sleeping bag torn open, a single drag mark through the dirt, and his trail ending in the dense undergrowth of the forest. A growl, low and primal, echoed from the darkness. It wasn't any sound I recognized. Miller raised his flashlight and swept the beam across the tree lean. Two eyes, massive and reflective, stared back at us. Oh, God! Miller breathed. It was just a glimpse before the thing retreated back into the shadows. Its outline moved wrong, unsettling. Too long in the arms, in the legs, a loping stride that was all power and unnatural speed. Jensen was still screaming for Simmons, his voice hoarse. We pulled him back towards the tent. We have to go after him. Jensen snarled, shaking us off. No, I said firmly. We call this in, wait for backup. And let that thing pick us off one by one, Jensen shouted. He had a point, but I wasn't throwing our lives away. I grabbed the radio, but there was nothing but static. Our equipment was jammed. It knows, Miller spoke, his eyes wide. He wasn't wrong. Daybreak painted the forest in sickly hues. We were exposed, vulnerable. We decided to head back to the main road, get to higher ground where we could potentially catch a signal. We didn't make it far. There was a clearing just at the edge of the tree line. In the center of it, Simmons hung suspended ten feet off the ground. He was impaled through the chest on a massive wooden spike that jutted from the earth. It was fresh wood, like the tree had been ripped out, sharpened, and... I turned away, bow rising in my throat. Miller knelt, hands shaking, trying to reach for his med kit. Jensen was silent, a dangerous glint in his eyes. That thing's toying with us, he muttered. I'm gonna kill it. We tried moving around the clearing, but every path led back to its center, as if the forest itself was guiding us towards that grotesque display. The air grew heavier, oppressive. A snapping sound ripped through the trees. We spun in circles, rifles raised, adrenaline pounding in my ears. Then a massive shape fell from the canopy, landing between us and the clearing. It was the creature from the night before, in all its terrible glory. A towering giant, at least nine feet tall. It was gaunt, starved-looking, skin stretched tight over bone. 
its face stretched almost like a dog's muzzle, full of elongated fangs. Long, clawed arms hung near its knees. Jensen didn't hesitate. He raised his rifle and opened fire. The bullets slammed into the creature. It jerked with every impact, but it kept coming. Miller pulled me back. Run! We ran. Blinded by panic, branches tearing at our faces, the sounds of the creature's relentless pursuit at our heels. Bursts of gunfire from Jensen echoed behind us, slowing further and further away, then stopping. Miller tripped, and I crashed down with him, tumbling into a ditch. Holding my breath, I rolled underneath a tangle of roots and vines, dragging him with me. Silence fell around us. Not the peaceful silence of the forest, but the heavy, watchful silence of a predator. I strained my ears, listening for any sign of movement. Miller? I hissed. A faint groan came from beside me. Relief flooded me, but it was quickly replaced by guilt. We had abandoned Jensen. There was no way he survived that encounter. We had to get out of here had to keep moving. I pressed my ear to the ground. Nothing. Maybe it was gone. Maybe it had lost our scent. Hours of crawling, weaving through the dense undergrowth. The forest felt like it was closing in on us. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made me jump. We came across a dirt road, the first sign of civilization we had seen in what felt like forever. We followed it, hoping it would lead us out of this nightmare. We didn't speak. The weight of Jensen's death hung heavy between us. A noise up ahead. My hand tightened on my rifle. Relief washed over me when I saw the headlights of a truck approaching. It slowed as it drew closer, the driver peering out with a puzzled expression. Hey, boys, he called, a hint of suspicion in his voice. Y'all lost? We were a sight, covered in dirt and scratches, our eyes wild with exhaustion and a terror he probably couldn't comprehend. I managed to explain about the creature, faltering, stumbling over the words. It sounded insane even to myself. His expression shifted into one of amusement. Now I hear some tall tales in this neck of the woods, but that one takes the cake. Bigfoot? Aliens? Waddle it be next? It was futile. No one was going to believe us. I thanked him for the ride back into town and refused to answer any more questions. The local sheriff gave us similar treatment, concern mixed with thinly veiled mockery. They thought we were lost hikers— maybe a little rattled after a cougar scare. Back at the base, the debriefing went as expected. Skeptical faces, raised eyebrows. Disbelief hung heavy in the air. We were ordered to take two weeks' leave, mandatory psych evaluation scheduled. We were branded. We would forever be the crazy ones, the ones who saw things that didn't exist. We never saw the creature again but I could feel it, lurking in the shadows. It had hunted us, played with us, and it could strike again, any time, anywhere. It knew who we were. It knew where to find us. For Miller, the damage was worse than the physical wounds. The nightmares stole his sleep, whispers from the darkness filled his waking hours. He couldn't shake the image of Simmons, the feeling of helplessness, of being trapped. They said it was PTSD, but I knew it was something more. A year later, Miller took his own life. They cleaned out his locker, sent the standard condolences to his next of kin. Life at the base moved on as if he'd never existed. I'm still with the team, ten years later. We hunt the things the rest of the world doesn't believe in, the things the government knows damn well are real even if they'll never admit it publicly. And every night, when I close my eyes, I see that clearing. 
Simmons hanging lifeless, Jensen's roar of defiance, and the creature's unblinking eyes staring out at us from the darkness. Jensen had been right. We were hunted, marked. Survivors? No. We were the living dead, our lives reduced to a countdown to the next encounter with the unknown. And the nightmares, they never really end. You just learn to live with them, the constant companions, reminders that the darkness is vast, and the monsters lurking within, they are very real. Sometimes I wonder if they put us on leave on purpose back then. Did they already know about the creatures? Tendencies? Were we an experiment all along? A test to see how long we would last, how much we could endure before we broke. Those thoughts, they're the most terrifying of all. They hint at a truth far more disturbing than any monster lurking in the woods. That the shadows we fight, they might just be a part of us. This happened to me a few years back, when I was a student. Broke as a joke, figured a summer gig as a campground host out in Yosemite National Park was a good idea. Get paid, spend the days hiking, win-win. My name's Eli, by the way. City kid, more used to sirens than crickets, but hey, I was game. Set up my little trailer near the Lower Pines campground quiet spot. Mostly families and those big, noisy RVs retirees seemed to love. Had the radio for company, and a stack of doggered paperbacks. What could go wrong? Turns out, a lot. It started with the whispers from other campers. Complaints about weird noises at night, things disappearing from tents. I figured raccoons, maybe a bear sniffing around told them to lock up food, be careful. Didn't think much of it until I saw the tracks myself one morning. Way too big for a raccoon, and something about the shape set off alarm bells. Then came the night Sarah vanished. Sweet girl, about ten years old, staying at the campground with her family. I remember her skipping around the fire pit, making s mores, eyes wide with excitement. Then morning, her parents running around frantic, her sleeping bag empty. Search party went out, rangers, volunteers, the whole nine yards. Found nothing, just like she evaporated. Folks were freaked. They started leaving in droves, the campground emptying like someone pulled the plug. My supervisor told me to stick it out, but I was about two seconds from packing up myself. Then it saw me. I was walking back to my trailer one night, flashlight cutting a weak path through the trees. Had that prickling feeling on the back of my neck, like I was being watched. I turned around, just in time to see two eyes flash yellow in the darkness. They were high up, way higher than any normal animal. Before I could do more than gasp, it was gone just melted back into the shadows. I ran back to the trailer, slammed the door shut, and sat there shaking till dawn. Next day, I went to my supervisor, told him everything, the whispers, the tracks, what I'd seen. He looked at me like I'd gone nuts, said stress was getting to me, blamed it on overactive imagination handed me a box of stronger tranks for the raccoons and sent me back to work. The nerve of that guy. Like I didn't know what I saw. Still, what could I do? Quitting meant going back to the city, back to my dead-end life. At least out here, I was scared in a pretty place. That night, I loaded the shotgun my grandpa gave me, the one I only brought for worst-case scenarios. Figured this qualified. Kept it by the bed and tried to get some sleep. Woke around 3 a.m. to the sound of scratching on the trailer's thin wall. I grabbed the shotgun, creeping towards the window. My hands were shaking so hard, 
I almost dropped the damn thing. Peering out, I saw it crouched right outside. It was huge, easily seven feet tall when it stood on its hind legs. For dark and matted, muzzle-long, claws-like knives. The eyes glowed that same eerie yellow in the moonlight. It stared straight at me, head tilted, like it was curious. Then it snarled, showing way too many teeth, and lunged at the window. Glass shattered inwards, a long, clawed arm slashing through the flimsy curtain. I fired the shotgun. The roar filled the tiny trailer, and the creature jerked back with a howl that made my blood run cold. Stumbled away into the trees, a flash of dark fur against the night. I stood there, heart pounding, the smell of gunpowder stinging my nose. Didn't sleep the rest of that night. By first light, I threw my stuff in my beat-up truck and got the hell out of Yosemite. Didn't even bother telling my supervisor I quit. Never looked back. Told myself I was imagining things. A mountain lion, maybe, some kind of freak natural occurrence. But deep down, I know what I saw. Those eyes, that snarl, they weren't from anything natural. Park rangers probably wrote my report off as crazy talk, just one more scared camper. The media picked up on Sarah's disappearance, of course. Speculated about predators, abduction, everything but the truth. Sometimes, lying awake at night in my cramped city apartment, I wonder if whoever took her, if it was... Let's just say I don't spend much time hiking in the woods anymore. This happened to me on July 8, 2010. My name's Eli, and I work search and rescue up in Olympic National Forest. Love these woods, always have. Used to camp here all the time with my dad when I was a kid, learn everything I know about tracking and survival from him. After he passed a few years back, this job felt like a way to honor his memory, to keep a connection to him alive. Lately, though, I'd begun to question whether it was the kind of honor he'd have wanted. Got a call in the late afternoon about a missing hiker Erica, a woman in her thirties, out alone for an overnight trip. Nothing too out of the ordinary at first glance. Her husband got worried when she missed her check-in time that morning. Found her car at the trailhead, right where it should be. Seemed like the classic scenario. Maybe she took a wrong turn, got injured, couldn't get back before nightfall. The usual. Started the search up her marked trail. The Olympic forest, she has a special kind of magic to her. That deep green stillness, the shafts of sunlight filtering through the ancient trees, the soft carpet of moss beneath your boots, it all feels so peaceful, so removed from the worries of the world. There's an edge to it too, especially as the light begins to fade. The trees thicken, casting long shadows, the birdsong quiets and you get the nagging feeling that you're not as alone as you'd like to be. Found her campsite just before nightfall. It looked like a hurricane had ripped through it, pack torn open, tent shredded, belongings scattered everywhere. Then I saw the blood. Lots of it, splattered in a wide arc, dark splashes against the vibrant green moss. Something had gone very, very wrong here. My training kicked in. I called in, detailing what I found, trying to keep my voice steady. Adrenaline coursed through me, the peaceful forest now sharp and menacing. I followed the faint blood trail, the setting sun casting an eerie, crimson glow across the forest floor. The forest floor seemed to tilt and heave beneath my feet, the feeling of being watched growing stronger with each step. I swore I could hear rustling in the underbrush, the crack of twigs snapping, or was that just my heart pounding a frantic rhythm in my ears? That's when I saw Erica's body. 
or rather, what was left of it. I won't go into the details, not here, not ever. But I can tell you this, in all my years, with all the accidents and tragedies I had seen, I had never encountered anything like that, not from any animal I knew. It was like she'd been, disassembled is maybe the most accurate word. Skin flayed, limbs bent at unnatural angles, an expression of sheer terror frozen on her ravaged face. I stumbled back, tripped over something, and looked up into the deepening gloom. That's when I saw it. Perched on a high branch, practically invisible against the dark bark. I can still picture it perfectly, absurdly tall and thin, like a skeleton stretched tight with pale, leathery skin. But what got to me, what chills me to the bone even now, were the eyes. Hollow sockets burning with a chilling yellow light, the light of a calculating, ancient hunger. It dropped down from the branch with unnatural grace, landing soundlessly on the mossy forest floor. In that moment, I think I truly understood the meaning of the word prey. Time fractured. I turned and ran, a scream tearing from my throat. Branches tore at my face and clothes, but I kept running, fueled by blind terror. I could hear it behind me, its long legs carrying it across the ground with unnatural speed. It didn't snarl or growl, just breathed, a chilling rasp that echoed through the twilight woods. A whimpering sob escaped me. I knew, deep down, that I wasn't going to make it. That any second I would feel its skeletal claws clamp down on my shoulder, feel its teeth, far too many teeth, sink into my flesh. And then, a gunshot split the air. The creature screamed, a piercing, inhuman sound, and seconds later, my backup team burst into view, weapons raised. They found me on my knees, gasping for breath, babbling about that, that thing in the woods. Later, under the stark fluorescent lights of the station, came the questions, the sidelong glances that whispered. He finally lost it. I should have lied, made up a story about a bear attack, something believable, something that wouldn't get me pulled from field duty. But how do you lie about a face like that? The burning eyes, the too wide muzzle filled with needle-like teeth? They sent me for psyche valves, wanted me on a desk job. I fought them on it, tooth and nail. Patrolling the woods, despite the fear that now gnaws at me constantly, is all I've got left. It's a way of watching, of maybe stopping it, and maybe, in a twisted way, of being the one to find that creature again. Sometimes, late at night, I wonder if it remembers me. If it waits out there in the deep forest, in the places where the light never quite reaches waits and plans for the day I'll cross its path again. Sometimes I think I almost hope it does, that there might be some kind of final confrontation in the darkened woods, me with my rifle and my terror, and it with its impossible form and bone-deep hunger. The folks at the station, they've started calling it the Moss Walker. There are whispers about it, hushed conversations that fall silent when I walk past, the same looks of wary concern they used to give the old-timers who'd been out in the woods too long. Say it's just a campfire story, a way to scare the greenhorns. Me, I know better. I know it's not just a story. And some nights, when the wind rustles the leaves outside my window in a way that sounds a bit too much like footsteps, I think it knows better too. I think it remembers the taste of fear and waits patiently for the day I slip up, the day I finally walk back into its hunting ground alone. It happened a couple of years back, and it still plays out in my nightmares sometimes. Me, Ethan Calder, fresh off quitting my marketing job at that soul-sucking tech startup in Boston, and heading across the country, just me and my truck. 
Figured I needed some open road therapy. Arizona hit me hard. Red rock country. Those weird saguaro cactuses sticking up like frozen alien sentries. It was beautiful in a brutal, teeth-bared kind of way. I got an impulse to take a detour down some nameless road branching off the highway. Bad idea. I should have stuck to the asphalt. Turns out that road wound its way through the very heart of nowhere for about thirty miles before spitting me out into this little town. Well, the bones of a town, more like it. Crumbling adobe walls, few signs of life except maybe a dozen horses tied up and snuffling dust by a faded cantina sign. That place gave me the willies. Not quite creepy, more like, dead like life shouldn't have hung on here this long. Now, my phone signal crapped out miles back, but with an actual town in sight, maybe there was a payphone, some way to tell Sarah I wasn't lost yet. She kept nagging me about that, keeping in touch, not just vanishing onto dusty backroads. I pulled up right in front of that old cantina, debated going inside to ask directions, but something made me hesitate. Something must have caught my eye. A weird shape hanging in a half-broken window next door. An animal skeleton, maybe? That seemed odd, displaying something dead like that. But hey, different ways out here, right? I should have taken that as my final warning. Instead, I reached for my door handle. And right then... A kid stepped into the road about six feet in front of my truck. Kids got to be seven, tops, wearing jeans too long for him, no shoes. Sons bleached his hair white, not a good white, more like it's faded to nothing. Doesn't smile, doesn't even blink. Just walks right toward my truck and then starts, scratching at the metal, like he's drawing pictures on my fender. Not deep scratches, maybe like he's using his fingernails. Hey, I say, leaning out the window. That's when I see him clear. The sun glinting off his eyes. No black, no white, just an odd silver kind of color. The kid finally turns toward me, mouth twitching half like he wants to spit, half like he maybe forgot how to form words. Then it comes out in this little choked voice. Just one word, leave. The hair stands up on the back of my neck. Look, kid, I need some help. You got a phone around here? A second kid girl, this time, older, steps out from behind the horses. Looks about ten, same blank eyes as the boy. She raises her arm, points back where I drove in. Her voice raspy and low. Not your place here. All right, this ain't just kids messing around. Something shivers inside. Not fear, exactly. More like the wrongness had just smacked me upside the head. Suddenly, my truck feels too small, too flimsy. I jam the door shut, crank the engine over. Need to move. I don't think these kids would even blink if I ran them down. No one would bother looking for me back on the highway. That thought keeps ringing in my head the whole time I back out of there, and even once I'm on a paved road, engine growling as I put distance between me and that sorry excuse for a town. Turns out that night, my truck decides to die on me. Middle of nowhere, barely enough starlight to see the scrubland whipping past my broken windshields. So much for open road therapy. Just me, an engine that won't turn over, and this gnawing sense of being watched. There's that word everyone throws around in spooky stories, watched. You feel it first, right where your neck hair turns stiff, then the certainty grows. There's something out there. And even without turning around, you know what it sees. Not something smart, exactly. Or thoughtful. Something hungry, a hunger older than cities and cell phone towers. So yeah, I panicked. Tore out of that truck, just ran. 
I don't know what direction, maybe some faint hope I could circle back to that nightmare town, or hitch a ride when the sun came up. Dumb plan. Especially at night. That land wasn't built for walking. Hidden ditches, spiky plants waiting to snatch at your ankles. It felt like hours before I tripped, went sprawling right over a pile of rocks. When I looked up, there was it. Hard to describe. Taller than it should be, and skinny, too skinny. Limbs way too long. My brain fumbled for the right word. Loping, not running exactly, something animal. That didn't feel right either. There was this flicker about it, like bad TV reception. One second a solid dark outline against the stars, the next moment blurry, almost invisible. And those eyes, bright enough to burn after images into my vision, that same odd silver the kids had. Now, this part makes even less sense like the brain tries to shove logic over a hole nothing fits through. The thing had something in its hand. Something white, long, dripping. Looked like a bone. A really big bone. Then the stink hit me. Rot, old meat. Something feral twisting right through the dry desert air. I bolted, heart slamming against my ribs hard enough to crack them. That thing, whatever it was moved faster, even over broken ground. There was this high-pitched screeching all around me, and another one answering from further down the slope. My head hurt from every pulse, and something was tearing at my lungs. This ain't right. We weren't built to run that long or that fast. The rocks gave way under my feet. Sand poured over me as I slid, not even pain hitting me right away just the blackness rushing up. When I woke, well, it's a miracle I woke at all. Turns out that slide I took ended at the bottom of a shallow ravine. Must have been hidden by scrub, saved my damn fool life, probably. Thing is, the light was different than when I fell. I stumbled toward the top, thinking maybe I passed out all night. Wrong. That silver-gray pre-dawn was filtering down into the ravine. That meant maybe an hour passed at most. An hour since that creature those things hunted me. No way did I lose them that fast. They left me alive. On purpose. Like playing with a mouse before the kill. That thought got me moving faster. No footprints up on the ridge. Nothing visible in the brightening sky. Maybe that bone it carried was bait, like some angler using a minnow. The thought hung there, too big to fit inside my brain. Reaching the highway felt like walking into a warm room after freezing half to death. Even the asphalt shimmer felt good after a night spent wrestling with thorn bushes. Took another forty minutes before a rancher in a beat-up Ford pulled over, took one look at my bloodied-up face and just nodded for me to get in. Didn't talk much on the ride into town. Don't remember what town. I mumbled accident, pointed west on the map to where my truck still sat stranded. I don't think he believed me. Don't blame him. He gave me a hard stare right before dropping me off by the sheriff's station. That stare said all there was to say, you got another problem none of us around here can fix. Called Sarah. Turns out that part wasn't a fever dream. There was an answering machine then, now. Well, her line's not in service anymore. Maybe she found someone decent while I was playing road warrior in the wilderness. Can't fault her for that. As for me, the cops bought my story well enough. Car trouble. Bad stumble in the dark all checked out. I even showed them my slide in the ravine, my shredded hands, all to back it up. Thing is, they knew those weren't all I got that night. That same cold-eyed look as the rancher. Not pity, something like recognition. Like I walked out of somewhere a man should never walk back from. I caught snippets of what the locals mumbled around the diner about some kid, missing persons. 
bad old stories told under their breath. They never questioned me hard. The thing in me that got scratched when I tumbled through the desert won't let that happen. Won't let me tell it all. The doc patched me up, wrote it off as shock, bad concussion. Maybe he had reason, maybe not. All I knew was, come sundown, I rented a car, got back on the interstate, and pointed myself east. I never did make it out of Arizona. That was three years back. My place is a cheap motel, cheaper if you don't ask when I last changed the sheets. Found some under-the-counter work through folks who also don't ask questions. Turns out, there's always call for that if you move in the right shadows, the ones most cities try to pave over and paint a happy face on. Sometimes, at night, I find myself standing in the open space behind the motel, mostly busted generators and weeds back there. That open space reminds me of the desert. There'll be that high, thin howl. Just the wind carrying across the broken land, people say. Maybe. It never sounds far enough away. Part of me knows, given time, they'll pick up the scent again. I haven't seen those silver eyes since that ravine, but sometimes I dream about them. That same scratching inside the dream, like tiny fingers dragging across my brain. I hear those voices too, low whispers. Words I can't understand. Something old, something ravenous. Skinwalkers, that's what they call them, according to the stories people spin behind half-shut blinds. I didn't believe it at first. Don't know if I do now. All I know is, that night out there, I became like the bone that creature waved under the stars. Bait. Marked. Not quite dead yet, but I'm no prize catch. Not yet. And something out there is damn patient. This happened to me on June 19, 1993. It's one of those memories you try to bury, but it always finds a way to bubble back up, especially at night. They say time heals all wounds, but sometimes it just leaves a nasty scar. I was with the LAPD then, still pretty green, and let me tell you, Nothing I learned at the academy prepared me for what I found in those woods near Topanga Canyon. I grew up in the valley, so I knew about Topanga, the hippies squatting in old buses, the rumors of weird rituals out there under the full moon. But mostly, it was just a popular hiking spot for outdoorsy types and weekend wannabe shamans. We'd get called out every so often to clear out a tripped-out trespasser, maybe deal with a domestic dispute in one of the trailer parks tucked deeper into the hills, that sort of thing. Everything changed with the first report. Two hikers gone missing. Now, that's not necessarily unusual, even in well-marked areas like Topanga State Park. People get disoriented, accidents happen. But then, we found their packs torn open along one of the trails— Bits of bloody clothing scattered amongst the underbrush. No bodies, just traces. And this unsettling feeling, like the whole canyon was watching us. A search party was formed, volunteers helping deputies comb the densely wooded hillsides. My partner, Jack McCord, older, cynical, with a beer gut pushing against his uniform, wasn't impressed with the mountain men joining us. Lot of camo and conspiracy theories ain't gonna find those folks, kid. He'd grumble. Truthfully, I couldn't shake the sense something was seriously off. The missing hikers were young, relatively experienced, not the types to wander off a clearly marked trail. And whatever attacked them was brutal and strong. Animal attack was the go-to guess, a mountain lion maybe, but it didn't fit with the messiness of it all. The second disappearance hit a week later. Single victim this time, a trail runner. His campsite was ripped to shreds, 
tent fabric shredded, and large patches of ground were scorched like something hot had been dragged over it. Then we found the runner's arm, or rather, what was left of it. Severed below the shoulder, the bone jagged as if gnawed clean through. The news hit the city like a bomb. Suddenly, Topanga Canyon was shut down, nightly patrols set up on the access roads. The media had a field day, tossing around theories from cults to escaped zoo animals. Me and Jack got called up for one of the roadblocks, a boring twelve-hour shift under the hot California sun. Jack spent most of the time nursing a big gulp and ranting about how the overtime pay wasn't worth having to babysit a bunch of scared suburbanites. I was getting antsy too when a weathered old pickup rumbled towards our checkpoint. The guy behind the wheel looked like he hadn't shaved since the Reagan administration. Name's Zeke, he grunted, thrusting a crumpled ID through the cracked window. Live up in the hills. Seen some things you city boys wouldn't believe. McCord rolled his eyes, but I figured what the hell. Like what, exactly? Zeke leaned forward, his voice dropping to a secretive whisper. It ain't right. What's been happening? Ain't natural. This land has old ways. And sometimes those old ways wake up hungry-like. I glanced at McCord expecting him to tell the old guy to shove off, but he was staring at Zeke with something like interest flickering across his face. Hungry for what? I asked before I could help myself. Zeke's gaze slid towards the woods lining the road, a shiver running down his spine. For folk like those hikers, like your runner. It needs feeding, see, or it gets angry. That's the bargain of this place. His voice was barely above a mumble. I shared another look with McCord, the unspoken tension buzzing between us. We both heard the whispers, legends about this canyon that predated the Spanish settlers. But to hear someone say it with such conviction, out loud, it changed things. All right, Zeke, McCord said, handing back the ID. You keep an eye out. And let us know if you see anything, well, unusual. It wasn't exactly dismissive, more like he was leaving a door cracked open. Zeke nodded gravely and shifted his truck back into gear. As he rumbled off, I got this prickling sensation on my neck, a certainty that old Zeke, crazy as he sounded, knew a hell of a lot more than he was letting on. I was about to suggest to McCord that we check in with the old guy, but a call crackled over the radio, urgency in the dispatcher's voice. All units possible sighting at the old creek trailhead. Suspect matches description of reported attacks. Multiple injuries. Adrenaline surged through me. McCord gunned the engine, tires spitting gravel as we roared off down the canyon road. Minutes later, we screeched into the trailhead parking lot. Three hikers sat on a bench, one clutching a bloody rag to his shoulder, another pale-faced and vomiting into the bushes. They told a horrifying story. They'd been hiking, sticking to the main trail, when this thing burst out of the undergrowth. Fast, massive, covered in coarse, dark hair. Claws, teeth, guttural roars. They said it was at least seven feet tall, strong enough to fight off all three of them. Did you get a look at its face? I asked, voice tight, the image of that severed arm flashing through my mind. The uninjured hiker, a reedy guy with thick-rimmed glasses, shook his head wildly. No, it was all blur and teeth. McCord radioed for more backup, and within the hour... The trailhead was swarming with deputies, park rangers, the works. A K-9 unit had picked up the creature's scent, leading us deeper into the woods. We followed, loaded rifles in hand, the dense foliage closing in around us with every step. The sun dipped towards the horizon, casting long, ominous shadows across our path. 
The forest had gone eerily quiet, the usual chirps and rustles of critters absent. Then that low growl echoed through the trees. My blood ran cold. It was close. A flicker of movement ahead. It hunched beneath a canopy of branches, gnawed like a massive, twisted hand. It turned slowly, revealing its face, and I felt a scream claw up my throat. Yellow eyes, blazing with bestial hunger, locked onto mine. Its snout was long, filled with rows of jagged teeth. It hunched close to the ground, yet easily towered over me. Impossibly long limbs tipped with razor-sharp claws twitched, ready to strike. Jesus! McCord breathed beside me, his voice a strangled whisper. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't an escaped bear or a drugged-out mountain man. It was something out of a nightmare. Pure, primal terror seized me. I fumbled for my rifle, training it on the creature as it let out a deafening roar that reverberated through the trees. Then it lunged. I stumbled backwards, squeezing off a shot more out of blind panic than any hope of aiming true. The bullet grazed its shoulder, drawing a thick spurt of blood that looked black in the fading daylight. The creature snarled, pain mixing with its rage, and swiped a massive paw in my direction. I felt searing pain and flew backwards, landing hard against a tree. My rifle clattered out of reach. The world spun, the trees blurring into streaks of green and brown. McCord shouted something, but it sounded distant. My ears were filled with the thunderous beating of my own heart. Through my haze of pain, I saw the creature stalk towards me. It moved with deceptive speed, its injured shoulder barely slowing it down. I fumbled at my belt for the backup pistol but felt an agonizing wave of nausea wash over me as my hand came away sticky with blood. This was it. I was going to die in this godforsaken canyon, ripped apart by, by whatever this monster was. A flicker of memory sparked, the image of that severed arm, the jagged bone. The creature loomed above me, breath hot and fetid, its claws glinting in the gathering darkness. Then, the crack of rifle fire split the air. Not a single shot, but a barrage, echoing off the canyon walls. The creature screeched and stumbled back, hit by multiple rounds. I craned my neck, blinking hard to clear my vision. A cluster of dark figures stood at the edge of the clearing, long rifles raised. One of them barked orders, and more bullets rained down on the beast. It staggered, roared in fury and confusion, then lurched for the undergrowth and disappeared with a final, echoing snap of branches. Harper, you all right? McCord was at my side, face tight with worry. Another figure knelt next to me, the scent of pine needles and tobacco making my stomach churn. Old Zeke, his rifle still smoking in his hands. Zeke, I gasped, my voice a hoarse whisper. What the hell? But the old man was already on his feet, scanning the tree lean, his weathered face grim. It'll be back, he said. Wounded cornered, that makes it dangerous. We gotta finish this before nightfall. I struggled to get up, but a wave of dizziness forced me back down. I... I think it got me good, I said, shame mixing with the rising panic in my chest. I lifted my shirt to reveal a deep, jagged gash across my side. Blood soaked through the makeshift bandage someone had hastily put on. Damn, McCord swore turning to the other figures now emerging from the trees. We gotta get him out of here. It was the search volunteers, the camo guys, he had mocked earlier. But now they were our lifeline. Two of them carefully fashioned a makeshift stretcher from branches and jackets. They hoisted me onto it, and we began the slow, grueling trek back to the trailhead. With every step, the pain pulsed in my side, 
but I bit back the groans, focusing instead on the darkening sky. Zeke led the way, shotgun at the ready. McCord and the others formed a protective circle around me, their faces a mixture of fear and grim determination. The creature stalked us from the shadows, its eerie growls sending chills down my spine. We caught glimpses of it slinking between the trees, those burning yellow eyes fixated on us. When we reached the trailhead, an ambulance was waiting. Relief washed over me. Maybe I'd make it out of this after all. The EMTs rushed over, cutting away my blood-soaked clothes, packing the wound. As they loaded me into the ambulance, I saw Zeke slip into the shadows, merging back into the domain he seemed to know as well as his own backyard. The hospital was a blur of fluorescent lights, sterile smells, and too many medical questions. They stitched me up and pumped me full of antibiotics and painkillers. I spent the next few days drifting in and out of a haze, the nightmares worse than the reality. Claws, fangs, and those haunting yellow eyes. When I was finally coherent, McCord was waiting by my bed. He looked like he hadn't slept in a week. The creature? I asked, voice still raspy. McCord ran a hand over his stubbled face. Never found it. Even with trackers' dogs, it was like it vanished into thin air. Zeke? I asked. He nodded. Old man came by a few times. Says it ain't over, that the creature's just lying low, biding its time. A shiver ran through me. I knew he was right. Whatever that thing was, it was still out there, lurking in the depths of Topanga Canyon. After my release from the hospital, I never went back on active duty. The doctor said I made a miraculous recovery, but something inside me had changed. I handed in my badge, moved across the state, and took a quiet desk job with a small-town department. Small towns have their own crimes, their own darkness, but it's a darkness I can comprehend. The nightmares faded with time, became less frequent. But sometimes, when a thick fog rolls in, and the wind whispers through the trees, I feel a primal fear claw at my gut. And I remember those yellow eyes, filled with a hunger that has no name. The aftermath, in a way, was simple. The story of the creature never made the papers. Authorities chalked the attacks up to wild animals, the missing folks declared. Lost in the wilderness. The canyon reopened, and hikers gradually returned, oblivious to the danger that may still be lurking just off those well-trodden trails. Maybe that was for the best. Maybe ignorance was a kind of protection. As for me, I carry the scar physical and mental, as a reminder. A reminder of the time I looked into the abyss, and it looked right back at me. And on nights when the shadows seemed to stretch a bit too long, I offer a silent thanks to grizzled old Zeke and his shotgun, for without them, that abyss would have swallowed me whole. This happened to me on October 12, 1996. My name's Wyatt Cole, deputy in the tiny town of Oak Haven, nestled in the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. Married to my high school sweetheart, got a little girl loves playing with her dolls and pretends she's a princess. I never thought my biggest worry would be getting back in time for bedtime stories. But that was before the night the thing came whistling through the woods. Started with the missing livestock. A couple of goats vanished from old man Simmons' farm. Then it was chickens, even a whole calf. No sign of predators, no scat, just clean disappearances. Folks whispered some old-timer nonsense about the Ozark Collar, a mountain legend about a monstrous creature said to haunt these woods. I figured coyotes, maybe even a poacher straying from his usual territory. 
Then, a hiker went missing. Young kid out on a weekend excursion, car still parked at the trailhead. We mounted a search party, combed the woods for days. Found his tattered backpack, some camping gear, but no sign of him. That's when the dread settled in, a prickling at the back of my neck that told me this was no ordinary missing person's case. The next full moon, I was on night patrol driving down a gravel road that bordered the National Forest. It was quiet, just the radio crackling, a lone owl hooting somewhere in the distance. That's when I saw it. A hulking shape at the edge of the tree line, silhouetted against the luminous moon. It was massive, moving on all fours with unnatural speed. For a heart-stopping second, I thought it was a bear, but then it reared up on its hind legs, towering at least seven feet tall, its form both hauntingly familiar yet horribly distorted. I fumbled for my radio, my voice catching in my throat as I reported the sighting back to the station. Before backup could arrive, the creature turned its head, its eyes gleaming like yellow embers in the darkness. Then, it let loose a howl that sent chills down my spine. The sound echoed through the hills, a piercing, mournful cry that was both animal and something far more disturbing. Suddenly, it lunged out of the shadows, bounding towards my cruiser. I slammed on the gas and swerved, the tires kicking up gravel as it swiped a massive clawed paw at the rear fender, leaving deep gouges in the metal. I reported my position, trying to keep my voice steady. Shots fired, I repeat, shots fired. I fired my service pistol out the window, more out of desperation than hope of stopping the thing. It roared in fury the sound making the hairs on my arms stand on end. It started pacing alongside the car, keeping pace effortlessly. The static on the radio became unbearable, cutting off communication with the station. Panic tightened its grip. I was isolated, alone, hurtling down a dark country road with a monster at my heels. Up ahead, a flicker of hope, the lights of Simmons Farm. Flooring it, I aimed the cruiser straight for the old barn, praying for a way through. I slammed into the side of the barn with a deafening crash of shattering wood and screeching metal. The old building shuddered on its foundations, dust choking the air. The cruiser stalled, crumpled but still in one piece. For a heart-stopping moment, it was silent. I held my breath, fumbling for the shotgun stashed under the seat the cold weight of it slightly reassuring. Then it started clawing at the wreckage, trying to get in. Scrambling out the passenger side, I ran for the farmhouse, a desperate prayer echoing in my head. Simmons, bless his soul, was already on the porch, ancient rifle in hand. Get inside, boy, he yelled, his voice hoarse. I dove through the front door just as the creature tore its way through the wreckage of my cruiser. Simmons fired, and I added my shotgun blast to the chaos. It bellowed in rage, momentarily deterred by the gunfire. Simmons ushered me into the house, slamming the heavy oak door and shoving a dresser in front of it for good measure. Mrs. Simmons appeared at the top of the stairs, clutching a crucifix her face etched with terror. Little Jenny was crying her eyes out, but safe. It's gonna tear its way in, Simmons said grimly, reloading. But we'll give em hell first. That night we fought tooth and nail to protect the farmhouse. The creature rampaged outside, its monstrous cries echoing into the pre-dawn darkness. We took turns firing, patching holes in the walls where it tried to break through. At first light, backup finally arrived. A team of deputies, along with a few fish and wildlife agents who must have caught wind of the situation. They found the cruiser, a twisted metal testament to the creature's destructive power. But the creature itself was nowhere to be found. We scoured the woods, found shredded tree trunks clawed to the core 
its tracks massive and vaguely human-shaped. But the thing itself seemed to have vanished. The aftermath was a mess. The official explanation was a bear attack gone wrong, the hiker presumed tragically lost in the woods. The Simmons family sold their farm, too spooked to stay. The town of Oak Haven got quieter, more watchful. Locks on doors grew stronger, streetlights a little bit brighter, and the shadows at the edge of the woods loomed larger in everyone's minds. I couldn't let it go. Even after the flurry of initial activity died down, I spent my off-duty time scouring old books and records at the county library, digging up any mention of Ozark folklore. I'd lie awake at night, Jenny's princess dolls on the floor replaced by blurry images of those glowing eyes and the mangled remains of my cruiser. The thing was out there, I knew it. The question was how to stop it. Finally, I found it. An old, handwritten journal tucked away amongst the dust-covered local history section, an entry pen nearly a century prior detailing a similar encounter with the same unearthly howl. The journal's author mentioned silver, and an instinct took hold, a sliver of hope in a sea of darkness. I talked to Old Man Walker, the local gunsmith, a cantankerous old coot with a lifetime of Ozark knowledge. You thinking what I think you're thinking, boy? He asked after I told him my theory. A few days later, I had a dozen silver-tipped shotgun rounds and a grim sense of purpose. The next full moon, I was back out on that deserted gravel road, parked off to the side with the windows down. The silence of the woods was almost deafening, the air thick with anticipation. My heart hammered in my chest. This was insane, risky. But Jenny's face flashed through my mind, and I knew I had to do this. Minutes stretched into eternity, then I heard it the mournful howl slicing through the night. Closer this time. I gripped the shotgun, squinting into the forest. There, a pair of glowing eyes fixed on my position. It emerged from the shadows, slowly pacing towards the car, its monstrous form taking shape in the moonlight. The rage I'd been suppressing since that first encounter boiled to the surface. This wasn't just duty anymore. It was personal. It had terrorized my town, taken God knows what, and it was time to make it pay. I leveled the shotgun and fired, the blast echoing through the night. The creature roared but kept coming. I fired again and again, loading the silver rounds with trembling, sweaty hands. It staggered, its fur singed, but its eyes still blazed with terrible fury. I fired one last round, aiming for its head. It let out a blood-curdling shriek, a sound that would haunt my nightmares forever, before collapsing to the ground. Trembling, I got out of my car and slowly approached, shotgun raised, ready to fire again if needed. The creature lay sprawled amidst the fallen leaves, its once powerful form still. I nudged it with my boot. No reaction. I lowered the gun, a wave of dizzying relief washing over me mixed with a pang of something darker. Back in town, I claimed to have stumbled across a bare carcass, already rotting. They asked no further questions. The fish and wildlife folks shipped what was left of the creature to some lab for research. The official reports listed an unknown predator and labeled the case closed. After that night, the disappearances stopped. The palpable sense of fear in Oak Haven began to dissipate over time. Folks went back to leaving their doors unlocked every now and then, though I noticed they glanced over their shoulders a bit more often when venturing near the woods. I became something of a local legend. Deputy Cole who stared down the Ozark Howler. But some nights, I still wake up in a cold sweat hearing that monstrous howl echoing in my ears. I see the yellow eyes, the shredded metal of my cruiser, and I remember the terrifying power of the creature I faced. Jenny grew up, had kids of her own. 
Some days I catch a glimpse of those glowing eyes reflected in my grandchildren's when they're playing in the woods near my cabin. It sends an icy shiver down my spine. My shotgun is always cleaned and loaded, resting by the back door. The silver rounds sit in a worn leather pouch on my dresser, grim reminders of that moonlit night. Sometimes I patrol the boundary of the woods, more out of habit than necessity. Old Man Walker is long gone, but his son now runs the gunsmith shop. Stops by now and again, always makes sure my supply of silver rounds is topped up. We don't speak much about it, just share a knowing look. The Ozark collar, the legend persists on the fringes of campfire tales. I never correct the stories. Let them think what they want. I know the truth, the terrible reality that lurks on the edge of our awareness. The folks in Oak Haven sleep a bit easier not knowing. And I'll stand guard, as long as I'm able. Against the day the shadows once again stir with monstrous life and that echoing howl pierces the tranquility of my little town. It's not every day you end up in a place like Devil's Chasm, Arizona, but here I am. My name's Clarence Montgomery but everyone calls me Monty. I moved here from Kansas a year ago after a divorce that left me lonely and craving a fresh start. I heard Devil's Chasm had a small, tight-knit community, and that was just what I needed. Last night, I was hanging out with my new friends Shana Beckham and Hector, Tex, Wilburn. We decided to explore the outskirts of the town where the old abandoned mines were located. They told me there'd been strange happenings around them lately, people missing and turning up dead with brutal injuries. As we started our trek, Tex tripped over something sticking out from a pile of rocks. On closer inspection, it turned out to be a human arm with clawed fingers. It was unlike anything I have ever seen long, scaly, and covered in slimy green skin. We all exchanged nervous glances. Shayna admitted she'd seen something similar on her uncle's deceased body the week before. He'd been chewed up so bad they could barely recognize his remains. Tex then added that he'd seen strange tracks near his trailer two days earlier. They looked as if some sort of reptilian creature had been crawling around. Though we were scared, our curiosity got the best of us. We ventured deeper into the mines until we came across a cavernous opening. There was something about this place that made my skin crawl, but none of us could quite put our finger on it. In the dim light cast by our flashlights, we caught sight of scales glittering against the cave walls, much like what we'd seen on the severed arm earlier. None of us had cell phone reception in such a remote location, and going back now wasn't an option someone or something dangerous was out there. As we moved farther inside, the cave became more confined. At one point, Shayna got stuck between two rocks, and Tex and I had to pull her out. I joked, Shayna, you'll have to lay off Aunt Paula's apple pie or we'll never get out of here. That elicited a weak chuckle from her. Nearing the back of the cave, we noticed something breathing heavily. We couldn't identify exactly what it was as it lurked in the shadows beyond our flashlight beams. But we were sure it wasn't human. Its eyes shimmered and I saw shiny green scales, much like those on the arm. Panicking, Shayna tried to call for help, but we quickly remembered that there was no reception in the cave. We knew that either way might lead to certain death going back out there or pressing forward into this creature's lair. Still, we decided it was best to learn more before attempting an escape. We watched the creature as it snarled at us, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth stained crimson. It was unlike any living thing ever documented, part alien-like reptile and part ravenous beast. 
Suddenly, it lunged at us with lightning speed, but ricocheted off the wall as Tex fired his pistol at it. Sometimes desperate situations bring out unsuspected strength in people. Shayna let out an ear-piercing scream at the creature while Tex fired his gun rapidly at its massive body. I used my flashlight to blind its eyes while also making a run for my life. Weaving through the cave's narrow passages, we desperately attempted to distance ourselves from the creature. Tex, Shayna, and I hoped to find another exit or perhaps some unforeseen advantage. Our adrenaline pumped as we stumbled upon a chamber filled with what appeared to be the remains of long-dead explorers. Piles of bones littered the floor, their clothing in tatters. It seemed that many had met their demise trying to escape this monster. My flashlight flickered over a rusty pickaxe leaned against the wall. Without hesitation, Tex picked up the makeshift weapon. If we couldn't outrun the beast— we'd have no other choice but to confront it. Suddenly, we heard growling from the entrance to the chamber. We turned our flashlights toward the sound and caught sight of those predatory eyes again. The creature lunged into the chamber and charged straight toward us. Shayna! Get behind me! I shouted as Tex stepped between us and the creature. With each step it took, our escape options dwindled. The horrific beast was relentless and fearsome in appearance, teeth dripping with crimson saliva, scales glistening eerily in the faint light. With determination set on his face, Tex swung the rusty pickaxe at the charging beast. It emitted a guttural cry of pain as it fell back momentarily from Tex's strike, but quickly regained its balance and continued its assault. I scrambled around looking for anything else useful while Shayna panically followed instructions she found scrawled on a worn piece of paper left behind by someone before us. Leave now or face certain death. The ancient-sounding warning was unsettling enough that I finally decided to attempt calling for help again. Miraculously, this time my phone's danger level notification indicated that there was now reception within our current location an opportunity one couldn't let slip away from us any longer. In a shaky voice, I managed to dial 911, explaining our dire situation while Tex grappled with the creature. The operator, understandably in disbelief, urgently warned us to remain as calm as possible and assured me that help was on the way. Meanwhile, Tex fought bravely. The pickaxe held little effect on the creature anymore, only managing to slow its advances. Acknowledging the desperate nature of our predicament, I left my protective corner and rushed into the fray, hitting, kicking and clawing at the beast alongside my friend. With every ounce of strength we possessed, we focused on staying alive while awaiting a rescue that seemed unlikely to come in time. Shayna's tears flowed in the midst of our struggle her cries mixing with the growls and hisses of the monstrous beast. What felt like hours passed by till finally, we heard distant voices echoing through the cave. It's a search party! I shouted to Shayna. We need to stay near them. We ruptured ourselves further into fight mode just as a pack of monstrous additional reptiles joined our original foe a veritable pack of alien-like creatures intent on flanking and destroying us. As an all-out battle occurred between us and these nightmare creatures, a new sound caught our ears, the faint whirring of helicopter blades above ground. Seconds later, a blinding explosion, too sudden for any strategy, shook everything. We held on to each other tightly as we plunged headfirst into another narrow tunnel created by the blast. Several cave chambers later, with an eerie sense of grateful amazement we found ourselves free of the monster's clutches. While the search party following our excursion had regrettably lost life in their quest to save us an indelible guilt that lingers with me they did eventually find where we had been cornered with those hellish creatures. Although I could never rationally prove what we encountered in that cave, 
I know without a shadow of a doubt that such vileness does exist. Clinging to memories of those we lost in newfound knowledge, we remain bound by an unspoken truth yet keep our dark secrets intact. An ironic life sentence born of gratitude now exists between Tex, Shana, and me as a result of the gruesome ordeal. We forged upon ourselves an unspoken pact never to involve others, for no one's benefit but our own in a heinous discovery that might irreversibly jeopardize what already fragile faith any given person could harbor in the scope of the known universe. I was stuck in traffic on my way to my sister's house in the small town of Harrington, Delaware. It was one of those mundane evenings where nothing seemed to go right. My name is Jonathan Whitaker, and I'm a mechanic by trade. Not the most glamorous job, but it feeds me. On this particular evening, I took a shortcut through the back roads to avoid the congested highway. As I navigated through winding roads, at some point I saw something darting across the road and vanish into the woods. The glimmer of its speed caught my eye, but I chalked it up to being a deer. Back in school, I was a track and field star. Nothing could outrun me. Pride occasionally gets the best of me. As the evening progressed, darkness settled around me, and my car's headlights finally failed just outside Harrington, leaving me stranded. Fortunately, there was no need to call for help as I had brought my tools with me and was used to fixing my own vehicle. As I hunched over the hood, focused on repairing the faulty connection, I heard a low growl. Startled, I stood up straight and glanced around nervously in hopes of identifying the source of the disturbing sound. That's when I saw it, a humanoid wolf-like creature crouching at the edge of trees near my car. Its eyes were bloodshot red and burrowed beneath a thick forehead that shadowed its snout. The shaggy fur covering its body appeared dirty and matted as if it had been rolling around in mud and filth. The creature's shoulders were broad with powerful muscles rippling beneath its fur while its limbs were thick as tree trunks. At that moment, it started stalking towards me with an unnatural gait that chilled me through my sweat-soaked shirt. My disbelief rivaled with fear as adrenaline coursed my veins. Somehow, it bore features of a man but inhabited the body of a wolf. I slowly began inching towards my car door, searching my mind for the best course of action. Yet I knew there was no time for hesitation as the beast maintained its steady advance. Logic told me to avoid provoking its wrath. Instead of confronting the creature... I decided to make a swift return to town and report what I saw. As a last resort, I grabbed the tire iron from the trunk, knowing deep down that my chances of survival were slim regardless of whether I wielded it or not. It was then that another growl emerged from behind me where I realized another creature had closed in on me. Trapped between them, terror gripped my chest while bile inched up my throat. Suddenly there appeared Martha Adams, an elderly resident of Harrington known for her curiosity and fondness of town gossip. She stood on her porch across the street, phone in hand and fingers punching at the screen with no dread. Martha! Get inside! The urgency in my voice broke through her concentration as she looked up and saw me panting with wide panicked eyes. What's going on? Should I call someone? She squinted at me in confusion without noticing the monstrous beasts nearby. Two. Things. Wolves. Just call the police, now. The creatures drew closer as Martha nodded nervously before scurrying back into her house. I turned back to find only a few feet separating me from their razor-sharp teeth. They were now closer than before. My grip tightened around the tire iron while the sweat on my brow dripped onto whatever courage balance remained. 
The climax was upon us as I pondered morbidly how this whole experience would change a skeptic like me forever. Despite my inner turmoil and encroaching doom, laughter escaped my lips, more like a mad cackle. My laughter died as I raised the tire iron high above my head preparing to fight for my life against the adversaries closing in. And so, the inevitable confrontation between man and beast had commenced. The creatures lunged at me, and instinct took over. I swung the tire iron wildly, hoping to deter them. One of the wolves stumbled back after being hit on its head but quickly regained its footing. The other evaded my swings and bit into my forearm, not a deep wound, but enough to make me yelp in pain. I searched for any possible escape route as the beasts continued to close in, saliva dripping from their mouths while their eyes bore into me with unrelenting determination. Then I saw it, my car parked only a few meters away. If I could reach it in time, maybe it could offer temporary safety, at least until someone came to help. Summoning every ounce of strength in my body, I charged towards the car with the wolves hot on my heels. With shaking hands and heart pounding against my chest, I fumbled for the keys and jammed them into the lock, swinging open the door just as one of the creatures pounced. Managing to enter in the nick of time, I slammed the door shut on the creature's snout before desperately trying to start the engine while they clawed at the windows and metal doors hungrily. Finally, with a roar, the engine came to life. Sirens wailed in the distance, growing closer by the second. It seemed Martha had successfully called for help after all. Panic started to subdue slightly as help neared and I realized that these attackers were starting to retreat. The police were almost here. As officers poured out of their vehicles with guns drawn, they cautiously approached my now heavily dented car. The wolf-like creatures had begun to scatter upon hearing sirens but two remained behind, fading into mere shadows before their bodies morphed into those of ordinary men. Stunned into silence once more at this latest extraordinary turn of events, my racing mind struggled to comprehend what had just occurred before me. Abstract thoughts of werewolves were still echoing around as the door to my car was pried open. Two officers immediately attended my wounds while I tried to make sense of the night's events. Two ordinary men were detained by the officers, much to their confusion. A police officer turned to me and asked, Are you all right? We received a report about wolf attacks. What happened here? He continued, glancing at the two disoriented men. Trying my best to appear coherent, I recounted the harrowing experiences and how the creatures had morphed before my very eyes into those seemingly innocent men. Beads of sweat had formed on some of the officers' foreheads likely unsure of what to believe or how to detain creatures such as these. Acting quickly, though, they placed cuffs on the men and began transporting them away. Answers would need to be found when dealing with such unordinary events. As I followed in an ambulance bound for the hospital, Martha appeared in her doorway, relieved for placing her terror, as she saw me retrieved from my ruined car. Expressionless, she moved her lips, thank God, before returning back inside her home. In the following days, so many questions remained regarding these wolves that could transform into men I had faced and what was happening in our otherwise quiet town of Harrington. But it seemed no one dared to delve further into it, including myself. For some mysteries are best left unsolved. We can only hope that someone or something keeps these sinister creatures at bay so that life's unsettling chapters remain closed. I woke up with a slight headache, probably from the beer I had after my late shift at the warehouse. My name's Bartholomew Heller but my friends call me Bart. I'm just a regular guy, 
working to pay the bills and keep a roof over my head. I was walking back home through Deerfield Forest, a large woodland area in Massachusetts. The sun had already set, casting elongated shadows as I strolled along the dirt path. Thinking about my recent breakup with Clarice was unexpected company for the walk, but it happened regardless. A loud rustling suddenly caught my attention. I froze. There, about twenty feet away, stood a strange creature unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Tall and terrifying, it appeared somewhat like a wolf but walked on two legs like a man. As the creature eyed me menacingly, my heart pounded in my chest. Fear gripped me in an unbreakable vice as this unknown predator seemed to challenge my presence in its domain. A glint of light caught in the distance alerted me that someone else was nearby an elderly woman walking her dog. Hey! I yelled out to her, desperate for help. She looked at me, puzzled by my panic-stricken face. Run! Go back! I urged her, pointing at the horrifying creature before us. Startled by my warning and the expression on my face, she turned on her heels and fled with her dog close behind. My survival instinct kicked in as I decided to make a run for it too. The night air sliced through me as adrenaline coursed through my veins. In spite of everything that happened to me today, work issues, thoughts about Clarice, this danger before me was all that mattered now. Suddenly, there was another blur of movement in front of me, something even more sinister and menacing than before. A group of people appeared to be restrained, their faces contorted in panic and despair. Quickly, I realized what this creature was capable of. It didn't just stalk and hunt, it imprisoned its victims too. The blood-curdling screams of those trapped souls spurred me into action. Heart pounding in my chest, I looked around for anything to use as a weapon. A rusted pipe caught my attention. I picked it up and gripped it tightly, attempting to summon courage. With every ounce of strength I possessed, I charged at the beast, swinging the pipe with lethal intent. The creature snarled ferociously as it responded to my attack by baring its vicious teeth. I was determined not to become yet another victim. Time seemed to slow down as I continued assaulting the monstrous being. A fevered sense of purpose consumed me. There would be no escape for either of us from this confrontation. It didn't take long for me to tire out, sweat streaming down my face as the unforgiving reality of the situation became more evident. While I managed to evade the creature's attacks up until now, an incredible feat on its own, I knew that unless someone came to my aid, help was unlikely to arrive in time. As if by some divine intervention, gunshots rang out from the woods. The creature stumbled back as its rage intensified with each bullet piercing its grotesque hide. Hope began blossoming within me. Maybe today would be the end of this nightmare after all. Staggering toward the tree line where help had come from, my breaths grew heavier and more labored while this beast would not relent despite suffering gunshots. Quickly looking over my shoulder, I saw its hateful eyes fixate on me the epitome of unyielding evil intent on devouring me whole. The woods seemed to close in around me as I made my way closer to the source of the gunshots. My lungs burned, my legs ached with every step, but one thought kept pushing me forward. There was someone out there who could help me. When I finally stumbled upon a small hunting camp, I crumpled onto the ground, relieved beyond measure. The owner of the camp was a man named Tom, who was as shocked as anyone to see a stranger in this part of the woods. I quickly explained the situation, my words spilling out in frantic gasps. Tom listened attentively, and once I finished, he nodded with grave concern. He immediately offered his help, telling me that he had some experience dealing with wild animals and had even seen this wolf-like creature from a distance, though he hadn't realized how savage it was until now. 
Together, we formed a plan. I would stay in the safety of his camp while he ventured out to distract and possibly drive off the creature. While it wasn't much of a plan, it was the best we could do given our limited resources and desperate situation. Tom armed himself with his rifle and set off into the woods soon after. As I sat alone in his hunting cabin with nothing but adrenaline coursing through my veins and fear gnawing at my insides, I found myself wishing desperately that I could help more. But as minutes turned into hours and night began to fall once again over the woods, I knew something had gone wrong. Tom should have returned long before dark so that we could reassess our situation if necessary. The deafening silence outside worried me. Each minute Tom didn't return made my chest tighten. Soon enough, though, I heard footsteps approaching. My heart pounded in anticipation. Whichever end result it brought, either safety or danger was near. The door creaked open slowly, and it wasn't Tom who entered. It was the creature, pierced by several bullets but far from dead. It snarled with unfathomable rage, its sights set on me. There was nowhere to hide, and without Tom's rifle, my defenses were meager. I prayed for a miracle as the creature advanced, and just as it was about to pounce, a loud crack echoed through the cabin. The monster reeled back in pain, fresh blood dripping from its shoulder. Tom emerged from the shadows behind the creature, battered and bruised but determinately holding another rifle. He doubled back after being injured, knowing his first weapon wouldn't be enough to finish off this relentless beast. With undeniable courage burning in his eyes, he fired shot after shot into the creature, forcing it further back. Finally, with one last scream of pain, the creature stumbled out of the open door and retreated into the woods. Its piercing eyes flashed one final time before it disappeared into darkness. Exhausted and panting heavily, Tom collapsed beside me. Once we had caught our breaths, we cautiously ventured outside to make sure the creature truly was gone, and more importantly, not coming back any time soon. The night air was silent once again, its defeat weighed down upon us both. We spent that night in fearful anticipation of an ambush that never came. As the sun finally rose on what felt like a lifetime of uncertainty, we left behind our makeshift campsite and found our way back to civilization. The experience left us scarred emotionally. I never learned Tom's full story or why he had devoted his life to hunting in seclusion, but what mattered most was our shared survival against an enemy so terrifyingly incomprehensible. In those dark moments of fear and desperation in that cabin deep within the woods, I reminisced about my friends who didn't make it past our first encounter with that horrifying villain's attack, their voices forever imprinted in my memories. I've never encountered a werewolf since that time, and Tom and I couldn't prove their existence, but the creature we fought against was undoubtedly more than a mere wild animal. It bore an almost human intelligence in its eyes, and its relentless pursuit of me was fueled by a hunger so malevolent that it could not be mistaken for anything other than pure evil. As the years have passed, the night we faced that gruesome monster has remained in my thoughts. Though I cannot forget the friends we lost to the beast's assault, I find solace in knowing that Tom and I had overcome such an inexplicable horror. This happened a couple of summers ago. It was still that weird pandemic time when most folks were just itching to get out of their houses, and you couldn't throw a rock at a national park without it landing on a crowd of stir-crazy outdoor enthusiasts. But hey, who am I to judge? As soon as the restrictions lightened up, I was heading into the woods as well. Call me Ethan, by the way. Outdoors a guy mid-thirties, and at the time, I guess you could say a little overly confident in my wilderness wisdom. 
That's what you'd get after years of solo escapades into the backcountry. Well, confidence almost got me killed. Almost. My destination was Colorado. Rocky Mountain National Park, specifically. Hadn't spent much time in that wilderness before, but those jagged peaks looked promising on Instagram. You bet I brought my drone along to get those sweet aerial shots. I went for a less traveled section of the park. There are miles of trail out there if you know where to look. I like that feeling of having the land to myself, especially after having dealt with mask mandates and lockdown cabin fever. The trailhead wasn't particularly impressive, just some gravel and that usual ranger board full of safety notices. No one around as I headed into the spruce forest, which suited me just fine. First day of hiking was good, a real mix of terrain, those gorgeous aspens that seemed to glow in the twilight, and then finally, a nice open spot looking right up towards a rocky summit to camp in. That's when things started to feel, off, for lack of a better word. I was busy setting up the tent when I heard the strangest sound. Like a high-pitched screech, but drawn out, mournful almost. Figured it was some weird bird I didn't recognize, plenty of wildlife around these parts. So, I ignored it and thought nothing more about it. The next morning, I woke up and had a feeling I wasn't alone in that big empty meadow. Something about the stillness. I hadn't heard one bug or bird sing. There was an eerie lack of wind, even though the day seemed clear. I didn't see anything, just sensed that primal instinct taking over the usual easygoing hiker mindset. It felt like watching eyes. I packed up quicker than I usually do an uncharacteristic urge to move keeping me focused. Had a drone flight pre-programmed from before the trip an epic, sweeping kind of thing. It'd get those grand scenic views the Rockies are known for. So up it went, buzzing into the clear blue sky. I took in the footage, rolling foothills, the lake I'd passed yesterday sparkling like a gemstone in the valley, then the drone zoomed on towards the more rugged terrain near the summit I'd eyed out previously. That's when I saw it, clear as day on my screen. Something dark, massive, moving fast through the shadows of the forest below. Now, bear sightings are no big deal out here. They keep to themselves mostly. But this thing, there was something unnatural about the way it moved. Two legs, not four an impossibly wide stride. My mind jumped straight to all those cheesy Bigfoot conspiracy videos you see online. I laughed at myself initially, and then zoomed the drone in closer for a better look. Yeah, that laughter ended real quick. Whatever it was, it stood almost ten feet tall, covered in dark brownish fur, with enormous shoulders and muscular arms as it broke its way through the underbrush and the head, it had this elongated skull shape that just did not register as right. It glanced upwards, right at the drone, almost as if it knew it was being filmed. That primal fear flared up like a bonfire in my veins. This thing was dangerous. The drone battery had dropped fast, and there was no time to mess around. One good swipe of those claws that were like gnarled roots and my expensive toy drone would be scrap metal. I guided it back downwards frantically. That weird cry came again, echoing off the rocks this time, closer. My initial shock was replaced with the urgent need to just get out of there. That was the day's survival instincts outweighed getting my money's worth from my park pass. All that wilderness experience... Worthless when something you should know doesn't exist comes barreling out of the dark to hunt you. I left my stuff there in the clearing, grabbed just my bear spray, and bolted straight for the main trail. No subtle moves now that thing could probably track me in its sleep. Every tree looked like a hiding spot. Every sound was a footfall behind me. I don't recall any particularly smart tactics during the first half hour. 
It was blind speed and that gut instinct telling me to just run like hell. Eventually, my lungs gave out and I ducked behind some boulder as big as a house, trying to catch my breath. Then the panic attacks hit. It felt like an eternity since spotting that creature, yet what if it just toyed with me, tracking me in a cruel game? Would it appear any second and swipe my head clean off? Taking a few deep breaths, I decided waiting for death wasn't a viable long-term plan. The main trail led back to Denser Forest and eventually toward the main highway. Maybe I'd stumble on another hiker, someone with a gun this time. So, I gathered my ragged shreds of courage and moved into the trees, this time trying to stick to the denser undergrowth, anything to mask my presence. I couldn't keep it up long. That burst of adrenaline fades fast. Hours of this low-speed terror left me shaking and weak. Then, through the foliage, I spotted something odd. A flicker of something man-made. It looked like a fence. Now, that made absolutely no sense, considering how deep I was into the park wilderness. Curiosity overcame caution for a moment. I had to know what it was. I moved slower now. If this was a trap... Well, the way my luck was going, it probably was. That fence was real. An old rusty barbed wire one, nearly hidden by the encroaching undergrowth. I peered through the gap, and that's when I saw it a clearing of sorts, and half hidden under vines, what looked like an old cabin. Smoke drifted from a rusted stovepipe out the roof. This place was creepy, like something from a horror film. Should I keep moving, risk running into whatever stalked those upper slopes? Or take my chances here and see what kind of human oddities made this their homestead? As I got closer, a figure appeared in the open doorway of the cabin. An old guy, scraggly white beard, wearing faded overalls and a beat-up cowboy hat. He had a rifle clutched in one hand. He stared straight at me with eyes that had seen things far wilder than me and my panic dashed through the woods. That's when I found my voice. It came out raspy and desperate, the story tumbling out in a chaotic flood. He didn't interrupt, simply tilted his head to listen. Once I was done, breathing hard, he said simply, Seen him once or twice around these parts. Got to live and let live, I say. They mostly steer clear of us folk if we do the same. Now, the rational part of my brain said this guy was crazy and I should keep my distance. But there was also a small flicker of hope. This old geezer had survived all his encounters. So could I. Besides, running for my life again didn't seem like it would work this time. Let's just say I spent that night by a campfire while the old-timer recounted his cryptic tales from decades living on the land. His gruff wisdom turned out to be the best weapon against the terror in my mind. I didn't sleep easily, of course. That eerie cry sounded a couple of times, seemingly distant, almost as if my presence had been acknowledged and tolerated. When morning broke, it was a decision to just turn back towards the ranger station and safety as fast as my legs would carry me. I told the rangers as much of the story as seemed logical without landing myself in some psych ward. I omitted the bits about the hulking monster with roots for feet. Instead, I talked about getting disoriented, lost, needing help. They offered the usual advice, check my vitals, that whole nine yards. That night found me safe in a motel room staring at the blinking lights of the cars passing on the highway and finally realizing how close I'd come to disappearing into the wild in a very different way. So, what was it I saw? I'll never know, and to be honest, I'm not crazy enough to find out. All I know is some parts of the world aren't for us folks, and sometimes the smartest move is to simply retreat. The wild will keep its secrets— that old mountain and its Bigfoot resident too. I still go hiking, 
just less adventurous about it, and always remembering, we're not always at the top of the food chain out there. It all started, well, hell if I know how long ago now. Feels like a lifetime and ten minutes all mixed up inside me. See, there's always this part of the Appalachian Trail I love to trek, the stretch in Tennessee around Clingman's Dome. That high elevation, man, feels like you can look all the way to forever from up there. Used to go as a kid that's probably why I'm so damn attached to the place. I'm a Lara, by the way. This time, I went the usual route, but on the third day in, I wasn't so careful. Lost track of the markers and went too far off on a game trail. It's stupid, I know. A grown woman getting turned around in the woods like some little red riding hood wannabe. I got myself unlost after a few hours, and all's well that ends well, right? That's what I thought until the next morning. Woke up, packed the tent, nothing felt amiss. Made coffee, ate breakfast, even had a laugh at myself for my little detour the day before. It was still early when I got this feeling. Hard to explain, not quite fear. More like an itch inside your skull, a part of your old animal brain lighting up. My body was telling me that my eyes weren't showing me everything. And then I saw it. Not really saw it, more like heard it, then glimpsed it between the trees. A flicker of dark, way too big to be anything a normal person expects to see. Just like that, my stupid city slicker self was overridden. Whatever made that sound was something my gut felt zero need to stick around and meet. That's when I ran. No idea where. No grand plan, just an old cavewoman part of me saying, Move faster if you want to see another sunrise. Trees whipped past, brambles tore at my clothes, didn't care. The noise, that deep crashing of brush, sounded closer and closer. Maybe whatever it was had lost focus, but maybe not. The thought only spurred me on. I stumbled up a rock face, nearly fell back down the other side, found my footing only when my knees slammed into something sharp. In the panicked blur, I realized I'd found something man-made. An old root cellar, maybe? Didn't stop to admire the architecture I ducked inside. I crouched beside the opening, breath rasping in my throat praying my scent would dissipate fast enough. There it was again, that monstrous crashing, then the heavy, shuffling steps echoing closer. The adrenaline buzz almost drowned out my own pounding heart. Minutes melted away. Maybe that thing gave up the hunt a stupid flicker of hope started to whisper to me. That's when a shadow covered the cellar entrance. There it stood, towering above. Darkest fur, almost blending in with the shade of the tree line. Massive as a grizzly but too upright, a sort of hunched-over silhouette, legs like tree trunks. And the face. God, that twisted face. Almost like a misshapen human sunken eyes gleaming too yellow in the gloom, jagged teeth and a snout too long and pointy. No growl, no roar just its breath echoing inside that tiny hovel. It raised a hand, claws more like talons than a bear's, and sniffed the air. I could make out its eyes focusing on the ground a few feet away. It hadn't found my hiding spot, not yet. But it could smell me. Every instinct told me the fear I was drowning in filled the air like a damn buffet for the damn thing. The shadow retreated. Each receding footstep seemed to scream its intent. This time, it won't give up so easily. A crash echoed out in the distance, followed by a scream so piercing it nearly made my eardrums burst. A woman from somewhere out there. Then nothing. I choked back a sob, realizing there were no rangers left searching for whoever that had been. 
My mind couldn't even finish the thought of what that silence signified. As daylight faded, my body screamed at me to run again. That thing could still be lurking nearby. Maybe even watching. Now it became this waiting game. Wait too long. I risk it coming right to my doorstep. Too soon, it hears me move and the hunt resumes. This wasn't just life or death. The idea of becoming something's gruesome forest snack haunted me more than being gone fast. Finally, when only the tiniest hint of twilight glimmered in the sky, I went for it. A mad dash to my campsite to gather my gear, every single twig snap sounding like thunder in my head. Then I bolted into those thick woods again, running blind. Eventually, it would end one way or another. Hunger, falling off a cliff in the dark, whatever the creature was didn't even need to chase anymore. The odds were rigged. Each labored breath brought the sting of tears. Branches whipped at my face, blurred against the darkness. It felt like hours, maybe it was. That tiny shred of dawn cracked the horizon just as my steps broke into a clearing. It was a road. It didn't matter what road or which direction. I got on it and ran. And ran. Days must have passed. Found a town, found a phone, they got in touch with the park rangers. I told them I'd gotten turned around, lost for two nights maybe. Sounded better than saying, A bear man on steroids was hunting me for sport. Didn't matter anyway. Didn't find another hiker alive or gone, but they didn't find her body either. Whatever's out there, they don't leave much to show, do they? Just those lingering tales the old-timers talk about. Tales of creatures so huge, so cunning, you get called crazy just for whispering the word Bigfoot. Ever have that prickling sensation on the back of your neck, like someone's watching you, but when you turn around there's nothing there? That feeling followed me around the day I made that horrific discovery at work. I'm Dr. Reuven Stoby, a geneticist employed by a discreet arm of the U.S. government. My daily commute leads me deep into the forested heartland of Wyoming, where isolation ensures our work remains undisturbed by prying eyes. On this particular day, the fading glow of dawn scattered through the dense canopy as my jeep crunched over the gravel path to the facility. My colleague, Jo Marchbanks, greeted me with her usual wry humor. If one more test subject spits at me today, I'm starting my own spit collection in return. She joked, making light of our often perilous research involving aggressive animal hybrids. The morning was anything but ordinary. Every screen in the lab flickered to life, showing a containment breach. Another day in paradise. I quipped while scanning the flashing red indicators dotting our elaborate security system, a system never intended to be put to such tests. Somewhere within the twisted mesh of unknown genetics and untamed wilderness, one of our experiments had gone south, far south of what anyone could have imagined. We didn't call for external help. Secrecy bound us tightly than any non-disclosure agreement could articulate. Weapon at my side and security team behind me, we ventured to Point Delta where the breach originated. The air was cold steel against skin, a sharp contrast to the damp warmth brewing inside my protective gear. Stay sharp, I murmured to my team, Cal Knapp and Tirza Selleck expecting nothing less than a rapid response should we encounter whatever had emerged from Pandora's high-tech box. As we combed through a particularly dense thicket, Cal halted with a raised fist and pointed toward an ominous array of mangled foliage leading toward an open clearing. The scene unraveling before us stopped our breath and our steps. It wasn't just the disarray or gore that plastered vines and soil alike. 
It was an unmistakable hue of aggression colorfully painted in nature's very own crimson. Our approach was met with an unearthly quiet as Cal inspects what's left of something. Was it one of our creations or something else entirely? Biological artistry courtesy of something with more rage than a bull seeing red. He muttered grimly beneath his breath. That's when it hit us. The figure standing motionless in shadows embrace at the clearing's edge almost seemed stitched from nightmares and folklore stories told to misbehaving children. It hunched awkwardly but radiated predatory intent, a testament to its feral ancestry no doubt crossed with human genetic meddling. I won't lie. My finger itched near the trigger. Instinct screamed at me to unload but protocol drummed louder about containment not eradication. As we inched closer under Tears's lead, her foot snapped a twig underfoot echoing gunshots in our heads. That's when it moved. I never realized how fear could act as an anchor until I saw Cal move backwards so quickly he could have outrun his own shadow on a sunny day. Yet here in this murk his attempt was futile because whatever it was fastened its horrific maw onto his leg pulling him down like gravity had chosen favorites. Gunfire shattered tranquil whispers across trees as shots peppered around beast and man. Cries morphed into roars resonating deep within chest cavities long after discharged rounds mirrored silence. Tirza yelled orders to fall back. Protocol became a structure we clung to, contain, don't engage. We couldn't match the creature's speed, its power. I heard its teeth meet bone, a sound no training could prepare you for. Cal's shouts turned to whimpers, then nothing. We regrouped behind the trees. The thing dragged Cal deeper into the dark. Tirza tried her radio, but static answered in waves of frustration. The signal was dead here, deep within the forest, Technology failed us when we needed it most. It must have hit an artery. Martin whispered after checking Cal's last known position. One glance enough to know survival wasn't an option there. We had no choice but to move, put distance between us and it. Our exit was miles back the way we came, through dense woodland terrain. Lights off, darkness became our ally as much as our enemy. Night vision engaged. Green hues painted our hasty escape. We marked trees with slashes of brightness, a path for eventual return with reinforcements. Miles became minutes under stress and adrenaline, until lights from the base camp flickered through branches signaling safety. Temporary, though it felt. We briefed command on the situation. I watched as expressions changed from skepticism to fear. Backup wasn't coming tonight. Dawn was their promise. Those hours brought silence but for the shuffling of boots and exchange of glances that spoke volumes of unshared fear. The morning count came up short by one, Martin missing from his bunk. A quick search revealed a trail leading back. Part duty, part guilt led a team including me back out. The sun rose high by the time we found him or what remained strung up between two trees like a macabre offering, skin peeled back in ritualistic precision though we knew not for what purpose or pleasure. Command made the call, evacuate and burn the entire site down. The creature made its own terms with us, stay and die or leave and live with memories that seared themselves behind eyelids every time they closed. We left with more questions than answers that day. Assumptions about its origin lingered on hushed lips but certainty remained elusive as smoke on wind, a creature defying logic yet existing nonetheless in vivid horror seared into retinas of those remaining alive to tell this tale. And we spoke not of Cal or Martin except in counts and reports. Numbers were safe, sterile things unlike the reality of their ends which were anything but...
whoever figured a trip to the vending machine could herald the onset of a nightmare clearly hadn't clocked in at the Hemlock Biogenetics Facility, nestled in a godforsaken forest in the hinterlands of Montana. It's not like you expect sunshine and lollipops working on government black ops projects, but nothing quite prepares you for Thursday's gone bat crazy upside down. My name? Call me Tanner Greaves. You won't find me on any of the usual rolls call or yearbooks. The kind of man who prefers his coffee black, his nights quiet, and his biohazard level 4 pathogens securely behind 3-inch thick containment glass. So, a stolen Twix bar was to blame for what came next. A mischief one of our lab techs, Arlo Petty, swore up and down he had nothing to do with. Wouldn't normally raise an eyebrow if it weren't for Petty's conspicuous wrapper strewn about his workstation. Exhibits a through E of his chocoholic tendencies. The lab's unspoken rule, don't snoop around without cause. That went out the window when Petty stopped showing up for his night shifts. Something smelled fishy and wasn't just the microwaved leftovers from the break room. It's usually the quiet ones you gotta watch out for, mused our security officer, Coraline Tress. Unpopular by name and by nature, Coraline had eyes sharp enough to lance through lesser lies, but this time, even she couldn't scratch past the surface. We had procedures for AWOL personnel, sure. But procedural rigmarole doesn't account for blood-chilling howls echoing from hemlock shadows after dusk. With dusk stretching its inky fingers over us quicker each day, it was only logical I'd end up trekking into these woods with Coraline on my six and government-issued sidearms, a piece of cold reassurance against whatever kind of hell had crawled out from our petri dishes to take Petty. Our search turned up sweet F.A. until we stumbled upon Petty's I.D. badge dangling off a bramble like some horror how Christmas decoration. The ground nearby was churned up something fierce, as if a brawl broke out, or worse, someone had dragged something heavy, unwillingly, deeper into an abyss that shouldn't exist outside campfire ghost stories. Skeptic as I might be, the workaday world doesn't ready you to witness broken branches smeared with fresh maroon paint that your brain screams is blood. It just doesn't. Shout if you see anything. I called over to Coraline, though half hoping she wouldn't have cause to holler back. It might be. My tongue tripped over words deadlier than any slugs chambered in my glock. Because what if it wasn't petty or something equally mundane? What then? Dialogue text boxes ticked through different nightmarish theories until we reached an unnatural clearing where the moonlight didn't dare pierce the canopy above a perpetual twilight zone for flora misguided enough to grow here. And there stood Petty, or what was once Petty, a macabre scarecrow skewered upon splintered wood. The sighs slipped silently between set teeth, as anger or resignation who can say? No screams rent our eardrums since what do you shout when faced with grotesque tableaus nature never intended? Shouting means hope of rescue or escape. This tableau whispered quite the opposite. But no time for despair's poison when shadows shifted. No spider ever wove darkness into forms so monstrous. No lore chronicled creatures like these. Also like nothing scripted by God nor Darwin's evolutionary penstrokes. Not this abysmally misshapen pariah rendered in charnel cloth draped uneasily upon its frame whence human words would never fall. Logic argued it must have been born from our lab's enigmatic entrails, but still bore such stark strangeness that resisted easy classification as any known biological terror. I turned from Petty, not looking back, not wanting the image carved any deeper into my memory. The path through the dense forest seemed to constrict around me, as if nature itself grieved and sought to choke out intruders. Stumbling forward, I pushed through brush and undergrowth, each snap of twig like a shout through a library hall. 
There it stood, the creature from Nightmare's Edge, a form not cast from familiar molds. Broad shoulders hinted at power far beyond that of any man. Its skin was a shimmering obsidian that drank light and blurred edges. Eyes were absent from its skull-like face, and yet I felt its gaze, hollow sockets that seemed to follow as I edged away. The communicator in my pocket was a useless brick. No signal could escape this place. Besides, who would believe this account? Words are flimsy traps for such horrors. It moved without sound, sliding between trees like oil through water, a predator amongst shadows. Fleeing sparked the chase, turning away fueled its interest. Retreat was instinct, evasion my survival. It clawed at space where I had stood seconds earlier, thick fingers shredding bark as easily as paper. First it caught Miller with swipes that opened him as one might a fruit, wet sounds of separation marking his end. He gasped for words but found none. We met eyes briefly before his light dimmed and there was little left to identify. Resisting the urge to clutch at his remains or scream my rebellion at the injustice, I ran. I kept forward momentum, darting past Reggie, who stood transfixed by fear, knowing his fate was sealed in my escape. A sharp yelp behind me signaled another loss. Then silence told of Reggie's report to oblivion, a tale untold save for the blood on leaves. When beacon lights finally broke through trees hours later, spotted by sheer dumb luck rather than skill, I emerged into a ring of uniforms and equipment that buzzed like an excited hive. Words failed me once again yet they demanded them, taking in my battered form with questions painted on their faces. They searched the woods afterward, found signs of struggle, and worse, but no beast of supernatural lore to pin them on. Medical personnel whispered bear attack and shook their heads but the coroner looked puzzled while stitching up the dead. Unnatural patterns danced across torn flesh that didn't match any bear he'd known. Days passed as they do. Life moved on outside those cursed woods. Funerals were held, Petty's empty casket most haunting for its hollow weight. Miller and Reggie's families clung to each other frothing at how random cruelty had snatched their loved ones away. The scar marks on trees made headlines for days until something more tangible took their place. People need something solid to fear, not phantom claws in the dark or voids where answers should lie heavy and neat. I live with eyes now drawn perpetually to horizon's line as if expecting dark forms to take shape in casual glances where light still fights shadow valiantly each dusk and dawn, the only vigil I can keep for friends swallowed whole by a world hungry and vast beyond comprehension. Those final moments before humans fade unanswered sit with me still, steel-gray aftermath where once laughter rang clear, vision blurred by images better left unseen, clear-cut knowledge stained deep within that some secrets keep themselves with teeth sharp enough to cut curiosity clean from bone. Out there it waits still, silent chaotic void with presence implied rather than confirmed, steward of questions without form, to prowl scenes that we fabricate but never truly understand or control, leaving only memories like graffiti marked upon life's walls. Here there be monsters." Every day as an over-the-road truck driver brings its share of the strange and the routine. This particular route led me through a stretch of New Mexico's desolate back roads that see more tumbleweeds than people, the air thick with the smell of dust and hot asphalt. My name's Barry Klein, and I've been driving these behemoth rigs for the better part of fifteen years. Never married, no kids— just me and miles of open road. It's a life that suits my loner nature, just me against the elements. 
Today's haul was a fresh load from a meatpacking plant bound for some supermarket in a town barely worthy of its spot on any map. The day began as any other. Check my rig, sign off on the manifest, grab a styrofoam cup of diner-quality Joe to go, not because I wanted it but because it's part of the ritual. That bitter brew usually kept me alert through the monotonous hum of tires on concrete. Midway into my journey, about fifty miles out from the nearest semblance of civilization, I noticed something wasn't right. Several vehicles were abandoned haphazardly along the highway, doors ajar like gaping maws silently screaming terror into the buzzing heat. It was unusual enough that I considered radioing it in until I saw her, a young woman, injured, her clothes torn and face smeared with both dirt and dread. She scrambled up to my cab frantic but mute, as if her voice had been swallowed by fear itself. I let her in. Humanity demands it. She scribbled down her name, Marin Tyrell, on a piece of paper with shaky hands before locking all the doors herself. She pointed ahead, eyes wild, whispering hoarsely for me to just drive. Policy dictates reporting this nonsense immediately, but out here cell service is as rare as truth in politics and my satellite radio had been silent since morning. We drove in tense silence until Marin's shaking hand grabbed mine from the wheel, pointing with trembling urgency to a figure standing off-road ahead, tall build draped in dusty overalls void of any identifiable marking or logo just another piece of this enigmatic puzzle unfolding before us. Ignoring every instinct telling me to do otherwise, I slowed down near him out of driving etiquette or maybe morbid curiosity. The sun threw long shadows at our approach, obscuring details until we were almost upon him. That's when you could see clear enough. His head was wrapped in cloth with makeshift eye holes cut out, an eerie specter ill-fitting for reality yet undeniably there before us. I've faced tornado warnings and wide-out blizzards, but nothing chilled my spine quite like those empty eye holes watching us pass by without so much as a nod or gesture. Just standing there like some sinister sentinel marking territory between here and Armageddon. Ahead lay an old service road navigable only to those who knew its whispers and turns as well as their own scars. An unlikely detour unless fate twisted your arm hard enough. Marin insinuated we take it with little more than terrified gazes darting leftward towards it. Silent pleas screamed without words. It became increasingly clear that each mile took us not towards safety but deeper into a labyrinth where normal rules didn't apply. Martin's fearful glances spoke volumes more than radio ever could. Was she fleeing or leading? My gut churned with thoughts best left unthought. A guttural clanking interrupted our descent into this haven for shadows. Somewhere beneath all that metal innocence screamed metallic pain. Engine trouble miles from anywhere is one thing but here? It felt like an earnest invitation by unseen hands eager for company. Cautiously pulling off onto gravelly shoulder notes danced upon tension strung tight like steel cables about to snap. Twisty trees curled around each other casting eerie silhouettes causing sober minds to see phantoms swirling amongst them all while under gaze from an unwavering watcher standing vigil not two hundred feet behind our wounded metal beast. Conversation ensued. Sparse words chosen carefully so not to disturb uneasy peace holding fragile reality together. Plans made quickly based on logic contorted by circumstance now dictated actions either heroic nor cowardly just necessary survival trumps everything when deep inside territories unknown and uncaring about personal plights or pleas. Martin and I exchanged looks, each understanding the predicament we faced. The engine's wheeze grew worse, mingling with the rustling leaves around us like a sickening chorus. We had to act. There's a town, Martin whispered. Twenty miles back. We'll walk. I nodded, my hand reaching for the car door. That's when we heard it, 
footsteps approaching from where our car pointed, slow but deliberate. My breath caught as a figure emerged from the twilight. Tall and broad, his presence dominated the surroundings with an air of menace that seemed almost out of place among the wilds. His face was hidden beneath a wide-brimmed hat, and dirt-stained overalls hung from his frame. In one gloved hand, he carried something long and metallic, a tool or a weapon, it didn't matter which. We couldn't face him head-on. We weren't armed nor prepared. We couldn't call for help. Signal was non-existent in this forgotten patch of earth. We had only the shadows and winding road to shield us. Martin grabbed my arm, pulling me back inside the car and locking the doors. The figure marched closer, his boots crunching gravel with an eerie tempo. We hide, Martin commanded, voice barely above a whisper. If he leaves, we make a run for it. The man reached our vehicle, pressed something cold and hard against the window beside me, an axe, and dragged it down slowly, peering inside with eyes that reflected no light or warmth. My mind raced but my body froze. There were tales of road bandits or psychopaths haunting remote paths such as ours, but never did I think we'd find one face to face or window to axe. Minutes passed yet felt like hours in that standoff, us inside, him outside, staring, testing our resolve or perhaps our fear. Then something changed in his posture. Perhaps he heard a distant sound we couldn't appreciate with our pounding hearts, a reason to retreat or simply lose interest in two stranded travelers. He stepped away without rush or urgency as if bidding us an unspoken farewell until another day. We stayed silent long after his form faded into darkness. When we were certain he had gone, Martin and I exited the car. With each step away from that scene of silent terror, my mind tried to craft logic but found none except survival instinct driving us forward with an urgency born from what could have been. You think he'll follow? I asked after hours of walking under moonlight that offered scant comfort. No, Martin said. He got what he wanted, made us feel small and scared. Town lights finally greeted us at dawn's break shaking off last night's veil of unease, though not entirely lifting it, as we reached safety with bodies intact but spirits shaken by an encounter nameless yet burned into memory. Once there among people and noise again, we shared our story with local authorities who listened intently with solemn nods. They called him the Watcher, a watcher who left few survivors to tell tales like ours, tales not of heroics but of frightful existence oracle pleading us away from such roads less traveled by sane men willingly. Back home days later amidst familiar walls and locked doors I pondered on. The Watcher, who might have been anyone, a lost man turned sinister shadow by circumstance, seeking connection through fear rather than fellowship. Life resumed its ebb and flow, marked now by wary glances toward shadowed corners and unlit streets, a testament to that lasting chilling encounter when on an unknown road our fate danced precariously in someone else's silent gaze. As the sun dipped below the horizon of the Sierra Nevada, the colors of twilight in their warm hues had long faded to an inky blackness. I, Leander Griffiths, had settled in for my third consecutive summer as a fire lookout in one of California's more secluded towers. It was a solitary existence, but the quiet always gave me ample time to chip away at the novel I was eternally writing. The night had brought a chill, and inside my humble abode, amongst the maps and radios, I wrapped myself tighter in a thick sweater once belonging to my father. My only company was the radio crackle and the occasional mouse skittering through old beams. A scream shattered the night's silence, 
so visceral and human that my skin tightened with an immediate swell of dread. The calls of injured animals were no strangers to these woods, but this sound was different. It bore a cadence that couldn't be mistaken for anything other than humanity. I flicked on my flashlight and swept it across the dense thicket below, searching for any sign of life amidst the blackened trunks and brush. Nothing returned my gaze but shadows that seemed to flinch from light's reach. Days later, hikers reported strange findings to local rangers. Small piles of bones arranged meticulously in circles growing eerily common along seldom trodden paths. A rational mind could attribute it to a poacher, perhaps, or an eccentric collector of death. However, speculation grew rampant when whispers of something roaming these woods with too long limbs and too keen an intelligence began circulating among locals. My friend Dalton Hethcott, who operated a gas station off Route 395, interrupted our bickering over trivial matters to propose something far-fetched yet chilling. Nature sometimes gets twisted up, he said between sips of tepid coffee. Makes you wonder if there's stuff out there that just doesn't fit into our neat little boxes. His lightheartedness failed to mask an undercurrent of genuine unease. Conversations within my tower were solely with chirps from dispatch or calls reporting wind speeds until one week later, I'd received a distress hail from another lookout station north from mine a rare occasion given our training to be self-reliant sentinels. The voice over the radio owned a startling clarity. Something's moving out there, too big for a coyote, and it's clever. The following day revealed dual sets of footprints shadowing each other around Firefly Lake, a popular campsite. Sightings continued sporadically, blurrier each time like seeing figures through frosted glass. Yet despite numerous attempts at tracking this entity down by authorities and curiosity seekers alike, evidence only materialized as lonesome oddities found after gruesome events, the small bone circles, or onlookers spotting glints of reflection as if something watched from afar. I found myself holding my breath more often now when analyzing some quirk of nature, broken branches or trodden grass signifying hidden obscurity in those unkept wilds. Days passed with tension among us as lookouts. We held firm to protocols and kept watch. Dalton and others dared not venture into the thickets after dusk. The gas station saw fewer customers. Talks of leaving town surfaced but never materialized. Everyone clung to a glimmer of normalcy. Without warning, carnage befell Firefly Lake. It was Hank Miller's, a camper known for his fearless nature. Two hikers found him at dawn, his remains scattered in a macabre display near the water's edge. No one heard screams the night before. The sheriff arrived, face grim, eyes searching for clues in the serene chaos of nature. Dalton joined me later muttering about a silent exodus that began with the Miller's family packing up their grief. I could have called for additional help or pressed the sheriff for answers I knew he didn't have. But the truth lay bare. We faced a predator none of us understood or could hope to contend with through familiar means. Three days later, dispatch relayed a message about specialists from the state coming to investigate. Relief felt distant. The entity, whatever it was, remained out there. On my last shift before evacuation, I caught sight of it through binoculars, elongated, sinewy form with matted fur, moving with predatory grace, an aberration blending with twilight shadows. No folklore knowledge prepared me for its stark reality, a creature that defied all logical categorization thriving on an ambush strategy too intricate for any known animal. It left us a helpless community marked by loss and uncertainty, a tableau of fear stark against rugged wilderness, while it vanished without a trace save for whispered nightmares and fresh resolve never to forget those taken under its silent watch.
My name is Nathaniel Drake, and this happened to me on July 16, 2018. Sounds odd for a story like this to start so ordinary, doesn't it? I'm ex-army, transitioned to the CIA, and somehow landed on the Bureau's weirdest desk. The one where conspiracy theorists are occasionally right, and unexplained, is just code for. Not yet understood. My first proper assignment should have been simple. A series of disappearances in and around Sequoia National Park. Hikers, the odd park ranger, locals who knew those woods like the back of their hands gone without a trace. No bodies, no signs of struggle, nothing that fit the usual missing person patterns. My initial report basically stated, the trees might have eaten them, and I half expected to get laughed back to a cubicle. Instead, I got a plane ticket and an uneasy feeling that my superiors knew more than they were saying. Sequoia country is awe-inspiring. Giant trees, those redwoods that make you feel like an ant, sunlight filtering through ancient branches, picture postcard stuff. But there's also a sense of unease there, a stillness that prickles at the back of your neck. Locals I spoke with told whispered stories about things seen deep in the forests, shadows that moved wrong, the feeling of being watched while utterly alone. I dismissed it then, chalked it up to small-town superstition mixed with a dash of very real fear after losing folks to whatever was out there. I spent weeks chasing my tail. Camera traps revealed nothing but skittish deer. Motion sensors, the highly sensitive kind, picked up odd bursts of movement, too big to be an animal, but erratically spaced, not the pattern of anything hunting. Frustration ate at me, the feeling I was missing a piece of the puzzle gnawing at my gut. The break, when it came, was pure dumb luck. A kid camping with his family wandered off trail, claimed to have followed a shiny deer. The parents were frantic, the search parties grim, expecting the worst. We found the kid two days later huddled beneath a moss-covered boulder, scared half out of his mind but otherwise unharmed. His description of the creature he'd seen was fantastical. It didn't match any animal, not even remotely. Most dismissed it as the ramblings of a terrified child, but a veteran ranger named Kendrick pulled me aside, his weathered face tight. It lined up eerily close with old native legends he'd been told growing up on the nearby reservation. He described a creature of shifting form, mimicking its surroundings to move unseen. Its eyes glowed amber, he told me, and its touch burned like dry ice. The legends called it the Hide Behind, a trickster spirit, not malevolent, exactly, but dangerously indifferent to a creature as fragile as a human. Armed with a kernel of impossible truth, the investigation shifted. If this thing was a master of camouflage, we needed new ways of seeing. I sweet-talked the higher-ups into borrowing some experimental gear thermal imaging modified to pick up subtle shifts against the background, the kind of tech that was half a step from science fiction. The first field trial almost made me a laughingstock. We spent nights traipsing through the woods, chasing thermal anomalies that turned out to be squirrels, a surprisingly warm rock, and my own overactive imagination. Then, on the fifth night, we got a hit that set my teeth on edge. A figure materialized on the thermal screen, humanoid, but its surface rippled strangely, patches of it blending seamlessly with the tree bark and mossy rocks. It turned its head towards the camera, and two pinpricks of amber light flared in the darkness. I swore aloud, heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. We got it. Kendrick breathed, rifle steadied. The orders were observation and containment. Engagement only as a last resort especially considering the vanished folks seemed unharmed, at least so far. We tracked it, the creature moving with a terrifying, 
unhurried grace. It led us deeper into the forest, toward an area locals called the grisly maze a tangle of fallen giants and dense undergrowth. It was just past dusk when we lost sight of it. The thermal signature simply blinked out. One moment it was there, the next the screen showed nothing but ancient trees and cool, damp earth. Kendrick and I exchanged a tense look. We were out of our depth, playing a game we barely understood, and the prize felt very much like our own hides. Then, the forest exploded with sound. A shriek that was part bird, part something I couldn't name tore through the air. Kendrick lurched forward, eyes wide. Tommy! He shouted a name I didn't catch, and then he was crashing through the underbrush, rifle held high. I hesitated for a fatal second, then sprinted after him. We burst into a clearing moments later. The scene was out of a nightmare. A family of hikers, maybe five of them, were backed against a massive fallen sequoia, batting at the air with futile gestures of terror. Surrounding them were creatures. Three of them, to be exact, mirroring the rippling thermal signature we'd tracked earlier, their twiggy limbs impossibly long, reaching. Their forms kept shifting in a sickening display of mimicry, patches of bark, clumps of moss, even the dap of light filtering through the canopy seemed to swirl and cling to them. But I could see their true shapes beneath the camouflage, tall and skeletally thin, with oversized hands tipped with claws that scraped against wood in agitation. The hikers were screaming, one woman already on the ground, her leg a mess of crimson against the fallen leaves. My training kicked in on autopilot. I raised my rifle, firing off a warning shot that echoed deafeningly in the sudden hush. The creatures froze, their amber eyes flaring bright. I shouted something about standing down, but the words felt pathetically inadequate. I wasn't sure if these things even understood language as we know it. Kendrick charged into the clearing, eyes blazing with a fury that eclipsed even my own fear. He aimed his rifle not at the creatures— but at a point just above them, and fired. A shower of severed branches and leaves rained down, momentarily disrupting their camouflage. One lashed out in his direction, but he was already moving, hurting the terrified hikers away, deeper into the trees. I was left alone in the clearing, three impossible predators focused on me. There was a moment, stretched unbearably thin, where we simply assessed each other. I could feel their gaze on me, not malevolent, exactly, but filled with a chilling, insect-like curiosity. And beneath that, a flicker of hunger. Maybe it was the scent of fear, or the way I stood apart from the rest of the herd. Either way, their attention settled on me like a physical weight. One of the creatures lunged. Not in a straightforward rush— but in a disjointed, flickering series of movements that made it nearly impossible to track. I fired, more on instinct than aim, and heard a startled chirp as one of its twiggy arms snapped. It stumbled to the side, rippling and reforming into a distorted imitation of an exposed tree root. The other two flanked me, their movements eerily coordinated. I was trapped. It wasn't the certainty of death that filled me, but a chilling sense of insignificance. To these creatures, I was simply prey, no smarter or more complex than a rabbit caught in the open. Just when I thought they'd strike, a new sound tore through the air, a deep guttural roar that shook the very ground beneath my feet. The creatures froze, and from the tree line, something massive emerged. I'm not talking black bear or grizzly. This thing was enormous, a good nine feet at the shoulder, with gleaming bone-white fur and eyes that burned red in the fading light. It moved with the terrifying fluidity of a predator, its toothy maw pulled back in a snarl that exposed impossibly long canines. The creatures, the hide-behinds, shrank back, 
their rippling forms revealing patches of fearful black beneath the camouflage. This behemoth, whatever it was, was something they instinctively feared. The beast, I still can't classify it, not definitively, lunged. The fight was a blur of snapping teeth and flashing claws, a brutal ballet of primeval fury. A hide behind shrieked, a sound like fingernails on glass, and then it was gone, vanished back into mimicry. Its companions followed, blending into the forest and leaving the clearing eerily silent. The massive beast paused, its bloody muzzle gleaming as it turned those burning red eyes on me. A low growl rumbled deep in its chest, but it didn't advance. Then, just as abruptly as it arrived, it whirled and vanished back into the undergrowth. The silence that settled was broken by choked sobs. It took me a moment to realize they were my own. The aftermath was a mess of bureaucracy and half-truths. The injured woman survived, her story dismissed as a bare attack. The rest of the hikers, profoundly traumatized, were debriefed and all traces of their accounts buried in classified files. Kendrick refused to speak about what he'd seen. The kid who'd wandered off only remembered following a shiny deer, nothing else. My sighting of the bone-white behemoth was the closest thing to an official acknowledgement of the impossible. They started calling it the Guardian, whispering about evolutionary offshoots and prehistoric throwbacks. I don't buy it. There was something eerily intelligent in those red eyes, something that watched us back with cold assessment. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't an animal. It was another player in a game I still don't comprehend. After Sequoia, I could have walked away, could have requested a transfer back to a sane world of human threats and counterespionage. But I'm still with the Unexplained Phenomena Task Force, or whatever they're calling it this week. It's partly morbid fascination, and partly the unshakable belief that if those things, the hide-behinds, the guardian, whatever else lurks in the shadows, are out there, someone needs to track them. Someone needs to be waiting in the dark, hoping like hell backup arrives before we're swallowed whole. The Sequoia case is marked, partially resolved, and life goes on. Hikers plan trips on sunny afternoons, unaware of the shadows that watch them back. Locals still whisper the old legends around campfires, their voices a mix of fear and an odd, ingrained awe. Maybe they understand something the task force and the suits back in D.C. don't. Maybe out there, in the wild places where the trees grow tall and the sunlight barely reaches the ground, it's wiser to accept that humans aren't always at the top of the food chain. Sometimes, we're just part of this strange and terrifying ecosystem.